Good, good morning to everyone. Um, welcome to the 32nd meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask you all to make sure, please, that your mobile phones are on silent? No apologies have been received. Um, the first item on our agenda is a decision on taking business in private, and the committee has asked to consider taking item five in private. This is to allow the committee to review the evidence as heard today in private. Are members agreed? We are agreed. We'll move on to item two, which is the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. I'd like to welcome Lewis MacDonald and Mark MacDonald, MSPs, who are attending the committee meeting for this item. This evidence session follows an announcement that the opening of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route will be delayed. The committee will take evidence from the principal contractors this morning on this project. Written evidence from the contractors was received on Monday and has been published on the committee's web pages. I'd like to welcome, to start off with, Stephen Tarr, the Managing Director of Major Projects Division of Balfour Beatty. I'd like to welcome Bill Hocking, the Chief Executive Officer, Construction and Investments from Galliford Tri, and Brian Love, Director of the Aberdeen Roads Limited. Now, there are various questions, and um, I'm not sure if you've uh, been to a committee before, but um, if I can just explain how it works. Basically, you don't need to push the buttons in front of you. Um, when, when it's your turn to speak, I, I'll uh, indicate it's your turn. If you want to speak and come in, uh, just try and catch my eye and, uh, and I'll bring you in. There, there will be quite a lot of questions that we need to get through. Um, if I think that your question is running on, I will, I will discreetly waggle my pen. Uh, and the more frenetic it gets means that the longer the you, you've gone on, and I'm encouraging you to, to, to bring it to an end so we can move on to the next question. It's just purely a, a method of time management. If I don't need to do it, I won't do it. Um, and I think that's it. And the first question uh, this morning is going to be from Richard Lyle. Richard. Yes, good morning, gentlemen. <clears throat> in a statement that you sent in to the committee, item 22, with regard to the final completion of the project, the remedial and finishing works to River Don Crossing are progressing as quickly as possible, seven days a week. It is essential they are carried out correctly, comprehensively, with safety being the utmost concern. I would agree with that, but I have to ask you, how did the defects in the River Don Crossing occur? Stephen. I'll answer that directly, Mr Lyle. Can I just, before I do, just update the committee, as we said we would, in relation to our statement that you referred to, convener, uh, just on the status um, of the current situation with the road? Um, within the last 24 hours, um, we, have, we can confirm that we have secured lender consent to the contract variation, uh, which paves the way for the road um, between... Uh, Stonehaven, Charleston and Crabstone uh, to be opened to traffic next week. Um, and we're working to complete the works at, um, at the Don Crossing, which I'll come back to, um, and we hope to open those works um, later this month. So that's just a quick update, Convener, on the um, status, as we said we would, um, to our operating statement, opening statement. Um, with respect to the, the Don Crossing, um, it's, it's fair to say this has been an unexpected um, issue uh, that arose for the first time in May. If I can just put it into context, um, we're talking about quite a complex structure. Um, it's 300 metres long. It crosses uh, the River Don. Uh, it has a surface area of about 5,000 square metres, the size of a typical football pitch. So we're talking about quite a significant structure. Um, it is a post-tensioned structure. Um, it is what's called a balanced cantilever form of construction, uh, where you actually construct it incrementally up in the air um, by cantilevering out formwork on both sides, which balances it. So there are something like 75 segments that you cast um, to create the structure. Um, and these segments are then post-tensioned. So there are longitudinal ducts that are cast in to the concrete structure, um, which, through which steel tendons are installed. Those tendons are then stressed and then grouted, and that's what gives the rigidity um, to the structure. Just again to put some uh, context around the size of the, the bridge itself, 
Um, this is 25 metres across. Each segment um, is about three and a half metres long and about three metres high. Um, you can actually stand up inside um, the structure. I'm six foot tall and I can stand up inside the structure. Um, what, what became apparent when we had cast all the segments uh, and we were about to start the stressing work, um, we found that when we first started stressing, there were some minor cracks that appeared on the underneath of the, of the structure, the deck, um, some, some minor cracking. When we observed that, we stopped the stressing operation um, to, to closely inspect it. Um, obviously, because you're high up, we needed then to get access, which we did. Um, and that led to uh, serious investigations. Um, we then de-stressed um, the bridge uh, and involved our designer to assess um, what it thought had gone wrong uh, and what the diagnosis uh, for repair uh, was uh, to be. Um, that led to some quite intensive uh, investigations to ascertain the alignment of the ducts. I don't want to go on too long, Mr. Gavina, because I can see you looking at me. All, um, but the I picked up my pen yet? You're uh, quite safe. But, but the so the alignment of these ducts through the structure is quite quite important. Uh, and what what became apparent is that the alignment of those ducts became, in some locations, displaced, which meant that when you stressed it, there was unexpected pressure placed on the concrete around the ducts. Um, so that meant that we had to uh, undertake a sequence of repair work where we literally broke out sections of the, uh, the deck in those areas to realign the, the ducts, recast them, uh, and then um, ultimately restress um, the structure. Um, because of the sequence of doing that and design, that was quite painstaking uh, and actually took us um, quite a period of time. Um, and that, in a nutshell, I hope explains the difficulties we've had with the structure and trying to predict precisely when those works will be complete. Because whilst we thought we had completed all of them, in October, late October, when we were stressing some of the final tendons, we found another issue, a similar issue, where we hadn't repaired the ducts because we didn't think it was necessary. We had to go in and conclude those repairs. Um, what I'm pleased to say, last Sunday, we completed uh, the grouting, so all the stressing and the grouting as of today is complete. Uh, and it's that that gives us greater confidence around completing uh, the Don Crossing, which is the one structure, the one area of the site which is holding up the final opening of the road. Thank you for your full um, uh, explanation in regard to that. But can I tie up? You've actually answered maybe my third question, so I'll tie up uh, both. Uh, who's responsible or who was responsible for the defect work and what works are required or is required to rectify these defects, that, as you've mentioned? So, so if I just take the last point, the defects have been corrected. Um, the issue really is around the alignment um, of the ducts and why they became displaced. Um, we believe that was um, probably down to inadequate provision within the, the structure to restrain the ducts. Because the problem with, with concrete and ducts being a void, uh, they, can, they, they, can, they can move. Uh, and we don't feel that we probably tied those ducts down sufficiently um, in, the, um, in, in the concrete pouring operations which necessitated the works. Um, if I say we are the design and build contractor, um, so um, you know, we're accepting that that's work that we have to do uh, as part of our obligations. Is this a new type of bridge, or have you done this type of bridge before? No, we've done this type of bridge before. And in fact, um, for those familiar with the, the area, uh, we have a similar bridge that crosses the D, um, the further, further south. Um, similar type of construction, and that went uh, without any issues. One of the problems and the complexities at the Don is that you have vertical curvature and a horizontal curvature. So it's moving in, in three, dimension, uh, three dimensions, uh, and that just complicates the alignment, the geospatial characteristics of the, of the structure. Could, Thank you. Could, just to help me before we move on to the next question, could you just give me the time scales for this? I, when, was the, when was the problem first identified? The problem was first identified in mid-May. Um, so it was identified in May. Yeah. Um, when did 
the solution to the problem become apparent? Um, that probably uh, took us... Um, probably took us about six to eight weeks. Um, and then, because of the nature of the, uh, the investigation work, because you had to effectively drill holes to identify the location of the ducks, um, and that there was a sort of a rolling sequence, if you will, of investigations and then repairs um, and liaison with the designer. Um, obviously, one of the things that um, we needed to satisfy ourselves is that the repairs in no way um, inhibited the integrity of the structure uh, when complete, uh, which is why we've had to do it in, in that incremental way. So, effectively... It's taking you five months to repair it. That's roughly what you're saying. But we didn't. We, when did you notify the government, just so I understand, uh, that there was a problem? Because we weren't hearing of, of massive delays. No, I think I think the the nature of the governance on the contract and the oversight by the contracting authority, um, they have resident engineers on site, um, so they would have been aware of um, of the emerging issue. Um, almost in real time, but they wouldn't have had necessarily the same understanding that we were building up as we were um, uh, actually involved in the, um, the rectification process. OK, so we can move on, but, but, but I mean, what we're saying is in May that, as Stuart wants to come in, uh, in May that it, it, there was identified a problem which we knew wasn't going to be a two-minute fix, it was going to take a bit of time and, and there was going to be a substantial delay. I, I think, in, in fairness, at the time, we didn't quite know um, the impact. Um, we didn't know whether it was... Because we'd only... We stopped the stressing operation, we knew that we had an issue in one particular area mm. uh, which we needed to address. But then we needed to ascertain whether that was more widespread, whether we had issues uh, elsewhere. Um, because what we didn't want to do is continue the stressing uh, and actually um, <coughs> induce stresses in the concrete unnecessarily. Um, so that's why the design, the diagnosis took um, some, some months. So the true impact of the work in fairness was, was emerging as we were building a better understanding of the, um, the situation. Okay, Stuart. Uh, it's just a brief matter. Aberdeen City Council are the ones who are actually got oversight. So was it Aberdeen City Council you told, or were you also, in addition, communicating with Transport Scotland that ends the government? We were liaising with the contracting authority, which is Transport Scotland, with its engineer, Jacobs. I think Aberdeen, you're absolutely right, um, Mr Stevenson. I Okay. So the contract is actually placed with Aberdeen City Council, yeah. uh, who are acting as agent yeah. uh, for Scottish ministers and Transport Scotland are heavily involved. So Transport Scotland have uh, uh, individuals on site also supported by their engineering consultant, Jacobs. Yeah. That, that, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure who knew what when, yeah. and I think that's now clear. Yeah, I, 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 I think that that adds a confusion in the sense that on the 23rd of May, we heard that although I fully appreciate the contractors from the Cabinet Secretary, continued ambition of a target for summer 2018, um, summer 2018 opening, Transport Scotland's technical advisors on site remain the view that late autumn 2018 may be more realistic. So we're not, at that stage, we know there's a problem, um, but we're not really knowing how big the problem was. Right, Mike, sorry, yours is the next question. No, thank you, Convener. I'm interested in the contract, and I want to follow the money, as it were, uh, in this contract. We were told uh, that this is a fixed-price contract, costing the taxpayer £745 million in 2012 prices, and the contract was signed in 2014. We were also told by the government that there would be no further cost to the taxpayer because of all the delays. Now, Mr Tarr, you mentioned the contract variation. Now, to the layman, like myself in this, a contract variation means that more money will have been exchanged. And I am also aware that you've told your shareholders that, um, and in both, both companies, that Gulliford uh, Tri, her costs have increased by £20 million, more than expected, and that Bath of Bidies and his half yearly results to its shareholders also said mm -hmm. that costs have gone up £15 million. If this is a fixed price contract, what is the contract variation and how much more money are you receiving from the taxpayer? Well, if I... If I, if I, if I Hold on. 
who's, uh, you're all wanting to answer. That's great. Uh, Stephen, why don't we let Brian come in and then I'll come back to you. I think it's worth explaining the financial structure uh, of the, 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 the contracts that are in place here. So this is a, a revenue finance structure for the government. So that means that the government pays for the road once it's built and complete. They pay an annual unitary charge on a, on a monthly basis. The government don't pay uh, Aberdeen Roads Limited any money until the road sections of the roads is opened and, and the road opens in four phases. Three of those phases are open and money is flowing for those phases. So in respect of the variation, uh, if the section, the variation will come live next week, the section from Stonehaven uh, up to Crabston and taking the southern leg into Charleston uh, will come live and uh, the government will make payment of unitary charge for that element of the road uh, proportional to, to the section that's open. So the, 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 the fixed price contract, uh, so, so the government pays annually for the 30 year concession period. Uh, Aberdeen Roads Limited enter into contracts with lenders to fund the construction works and we enter into a fixed price contract with the construction joint venture. Uh, that contract is, is uh, financed by our debt uh, funded from markets. Yeah. So I'm concentrating on the cost of the taxpayer and we have been told by ministers in, to this committee that the cost of the taxpayer is £745 million fixed price to build this road. Um, the point I'm trying to get at is, when you say the contract, I'm, I'm interested in this contract variation. The contract's been signed, fixed price, we all know what the situation is. What is this contract variation, and are you receiving any more taxpayers, over and above, taxpayers money over and above the £745 million for this, for this contract? And I'm not talking about the 30-year maintenance, I'm talking about the, the build contract. Apologies. So... The, the government only pay Aberdeen Roads Limited uh, once, once sections of the roads are open. Yeah. There's a saving as a result of, you know, we're all pre predict, pre predicting that the road would be open earlier than it is. So actually the government have paid less to date uh, than, than they would have been projected when we entered contract. Yeah, but Could I just, so, uh, if I just make an um, observation. Um, the section that we're talking about opening next week, which is the 30 kilometre section, um, was not... Uh, was not contemplated at the time the contract was structured. So there were, there were four sectional completions, three of which, as we know, are open to traffic as of today and as of you know, from last summer. Um, and the final one across the Don is the, is the fourth. Effectively, what we're talking about here is a fifth sectional completion termed PTU2B in our written statement. And it's that that required a legal um, change in order to bring that into effect. Um, so it wasn't part of the original contract and we had to negotiate um, with um, Transport Scotland uh, the terms of that variation because it essentially involved an earlier step up, as Brian was saying, in the unitary charge uh, that wasn't originally contemplated. So it was that, it was that, that's what, when we talk about the variation, that's, that's what we mean. I am, I am with you, I am with you. I, I understand entirely what you're saying. My question is, over and above the £745 million, I know it's only released as each section is open. No, no, there's no... So a, there's no more taxpayers' money going to your companies as a result of you opening the road early? No, no. Sorry, Sorry. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to just... So I fully understand that, because I, I, I'm not sure I do. The contract was £745 million, and that's for all the works on this thing. But you're saying that an extra bit was added in and are you, are you getting extra money for that? No, I think, if I can answer that, I think a subset has been added in, which means we get a proportion of the unitary charge a little earlier than we might otherwise have got it. That's what, we, that's what we're doing. Yes. Sorry, Mike. Yeah. So that we're all... I think I understand what's going on here, but I want to make sure that we all fully understand the situation. The road from Stonehaven to West Hill, Kingswells, basically, has been ready, apart from the final sign-off and police sign-off, etc., has been ready for traffic for two to three months. We, we know that. So it was part of the section which included the br bridge over the Don as well. So that's why it hasn't been handed over and you haven't had, had your money yet because of the bridge. So this contract variation is about the road from Stonehaven to West Hill, Kings Wells, so you've had to have this contract variation so you could hand the road over to the, to, the, to the government and the government could pay its due to you for that road. 
So the, the government still owes you money for the bridge when you finish the bridge. So <clears throat> the point I was asking, and I think it's clear, is you've made it clear that there's no extra over and above the £745 million of taxpayers' money. So you're, you're, you're taking the loss yourselves. Is that correct? I think, I think there may be a, a, a terminology uh, confusion here. With regard to the variation, um, that proportion of the road which we'll open next week uh, is just we get paid a proportional unitary charge as a percentage of the whole charge. That's the variation. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's no secret that we've, we face some significant challenges on this project. Um, you know, very inclement weather, the worst weather since records began the demise of Carillion, and um, some issues regarding utility diversions, delays to those diversions. So um, Mr Matheson has uh, mentioned in his statement that we have um, some commercial issues with Transport Scotland to discuss. That's not unusual uh, for a pro pro project of this nature and size, um, and, and we will continue with those discussions. Is that what you... Is that the, because the point uh, my of last question? and final question was going to be, now that you've <laughs> confirmed that there's no extra money, I'm puzzled, because as I understand it, <clears throat> you've put in a claim to the Scottish Government for extra money. So that's what's puzzling me. If you're telling us that there's no extra money over and above the taxpayer contribution of £745 million for a fixed price contract, as a layman, I know what a fixed price contract is. It, are you claiming more money over and above? I keep going back to the same question because it, it, it doesn't, what you're saying is doesn't follow logically. I understand when you're saying there's no more money over and above the 74, what, 745 million pounds contract, but you've also put in a claim to the Scottish Government for more money. What is that? that, that what is that? Right, so, so there's no change to the unitary charge over the 30 years. I think that's the first thing we need to get uh, secured. The second thing is, yes, we have put in forward a claim to Transport Scotland in respect of some of the issues that we face in the project, where we believe the risk lies with, with Transport Scotland, and that is what we will be discussing with them. And those, those risks relate um, to uh, relief events for weather and for delays in, in uh, statutory uh, utility diversions. Contract, then. Sorry. Uh, Stuart, you want to come in and ask specifically about the claims. And my, I then want to go around and see if other people can get a few answers, and I'll come back to you. So, Stuart, followed by Peter. Um, I, I've dealt with a lot of contracts in my, my life, and I just want to understand the structure of the contract. I'm not asking you to open up the detail, because that's a commercially sensitive issue. Is it structured, as most contracts I've had to deal with of this character, that basically the works are described in a schedule and, and that in any project, both sides of the contract will inevitably discover that there is a need for variation in the works described in the schedule. And is there a process whereby, if there are works that change in the schedule, that are agreed by between the parties, that there is a repricing associated with that change to that schedule of works? And I'm getting a nodding head uh, from Bill uh, Hawking, so I think that understanding that I would have from my experience is correct in this context. The next question is, have there been changes to the description of works? And I'd be astonished if the answer is no. I've never run a project where there haven't been changes to the schedule. There have been changes, have there? Yes, I, I can ask that, Bill. Sorry. Yeah, there's been, there's been a number of sort of change orders and variations through the, the, the contract period, as you'd expect and, and as, as you've outlined. Uh, I will say, though, that the, the, the value of those changes in the context of the project has been, been very modest, yeah. And indeed, it's perfectly possible for these changes to reduce the price. It does, yeah, it can, yeah. Uh, have there been any that have done that? Yes, there's been changes both ways, yeah. So there have been changes that have reduced the price and there have been changes that increased the price. Now, the commercial discussions you're having with the government, are they related solely and in total to the changes to the schedule? Or are they on other matters and other parts of the contract? The, the claim is on other matters. Yeah. Right, OK. Are you able to open up what these other matters are for us to to any extent that doesn't compromise your ongoing discussions, which I understand you would necessarily want to protect at this stage. Yeah, the claim... So yeah, go for it. Just, um, just picking up on something that Bill said earlier around, you know, the issues that have frustrated the progress of the works. Um, what, one of the most significant has been uh, the early work with the utility um, 
providers. This contract is quite extreme in, in the number of utilities that crisscross the scheme. So there are something like 300 um, such utility paths uh, that cross the scheme throughout its 58 kilometre length. Um, and you'll understand that the diversion of those utilities uh, in consort with the sequence of our works is quite a critical uh, element to the efficient progress of the works. Um, so the claim we have with the contracting authority with Transport Scotland actually stems from delays, underperformance uh, in relation to the, those utility providers, whether that's electric, underground, overground communications, water and so forth. Uh, and it's those, um, those delays that have um, disrupted the progress of the works. And, and those issues lie at the heart of our uh, our claim against Transport Scotland. I know others want to come in, so I'll make this my last little bit, convener. So is the dispute, therefore, about how the, how the contract allocates responsibility for the utilities' diversions? Because I would have expected, but I haven't seen the contract, and of course it's a matter of negotiation, that it would be the responsibility of the contractor to obtain these permissions. Is the dispute around who is who actually carries the risk that's associated with the utility diversions. Because although the complexity might have not have been known at the front, and indeed you could not commit on the timetable that utility providers would work to, um, the contract ought to make clear who has the responsibility. It, whose responsibility was it? I, I think the, um, the nature of the contract is, is as has been characterised broadly, a, one that transfers significant risk to the, to the private sector. Um, with utilities, utilities are paid for by the public sector. Um, and there are discussions with those utility companies that predate our involvement um, in, in the scheme. So you have this transfer, uh, and there are obligations that are placed uh, on, on the contractor to work and manage um, the... Um, the utility companies work uh, and how their apparatus is coordinated with the design of the work that we do. Um, so you are getting into slightly finer points of risk allocation as to whether uh, there are gaps um, for which others, you know, in this case Transform, actually carries uh, some liability. And, it, and it's, those, it's those issues, Mr Stevenson, that lie at the heart of, um, of our commercial um, claim. Stephen, can, again, I'm, I'm just interested in timelines before I move on to the next question. Can you confirm that those timelines for the utilities, the major problems with the utilities, which the Cabinet Secretary um, came to the committee in March 2017, that was the time you were having the problems with the utilities? Well, the, the actual issues with utilities um, began before that. But I that's when it was at a crescendo. What's, 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 what, again, a, a little bit like the Don, you had the emerging impacts uh, of those utilities. I mean, some, you know, some were completed on time and others were almost 18 months late. So you had quite a spectrum um, of, um, of disruption. But, 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 but in March, the Cabinet Secretary came to the committee and it was my, my understanding at that stage that there were major problems with the utility which could have, could have caused the road to, to, to be delayed. And it was March, the critical period, 2017. But he then, when he spoke, spoke to the committee on, in March 2017, he said that it was still going to open on time. So it indicated that the problem with the utilities had disappeared. Are you telling me that the utility problem hadn't disappeared in March 2017? and 17, and that there were still ongoing problems, and it, there was then going to be a delay to the road which we should have known about? I think, I think um, where we were there is that um, um, we were working hard to mitigate the effects of those utility diversion delays, and those, <clears throat> those delays have been exacerbated, of course, by the extreme weather which we'd, we'd had. So we've been working, well, the two remaining parties, the joint venture, have been working tirelessly to, to mitigate those delays. OK, but the mitigation of the, 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 the extreme weather, the Cabinet Secretary came to us on the 14th of December to tell us that there was a problem with the extreme weather conditions and it had been the wettest autumn in Aberdeenshire, but work was still going on on the A9, but not on the uh, 
peripheral road and that digging had to stop. But it was March he came to tell us, he was coming to tell us there was a problem, which everyone had heard about on the ground, but at that stage still said that the road was going to open on time. So it indicated to me in the committee, I think at that stage, that we thought the road problems with the utilities had been resolved. But that's not the case, you're saying? Well, I think that the impact of the utilities has been very far-reaching. Um, I, think, I think it's fair to say that we had a programme that had us finishing... Uh, I forget the date at the top of my head. I can look it up and write you later if you wish. But um, had us finishing around about uh, the same time as the Don, and then the Spring delays Spring. with the Don uh, pushed the, the end date out further. It's, it's perhaps worth uh, putting a bit of context around the utilities in this project. I mean, there's an excess of 300 utility diversions required to, uh, to put the road in place. You know, that's an average of one utility every 200 metres across a 58 kilometre stretch. Uh, to to generalise and summarise all that activity, which is enormous, into a, a simple, concise statement is an extremely difficult thing. I, I, I absolutely understand that. And some of the utilities will be major and some of them will be relatively minor from individual uh, telephone connections to, to possibly massive telephone connections. I, we haven't got time to push this, I'm afraid, because I want to take uh, Peter and then Jamie, and then I need to, to bring in some other members. Peter, morning, concise. Morning, gentlemen. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still interested in, in the, the delay to opening the Krebs and Stonehaven part of the road. We know you've told us you don't get paid any money until the road, a, a section of the road is open. And you've told us, and we know, that that Krebs and Stonehaven stretch has been finished for several weeks, if not months. So, and you've now tell, told us today that you have got con a lender consent to open that piece of road. It would have seemed, and that seems to have taken many weeks to get lender consent. I can't understand why that would be the case, given that if you had opened this road two months ago, you would have had the money in your, po in your pocket two months ago. So why has lender consent been such a difficult uh, thing to achieve? Um, it, because it would, it, to me, it seems it would be it would be dead easy for it to get lender consent because you'd get some money into your bank account. So can you explain why that has taken, you know, several weeks or months? Certainly, uh, <clears throat> I think Steve and Brian have, have mentioned before, but there was no contractual mechanism to open that section in the contract. It didn't exist, so uh, it would have we, we couldn't have opened that section without willfully breaching the contract. Uh, that, that's where we are. That's, that's just a fact of the contract. And that is why we needed the variation that we spoke about earlier on to the contract to enable us to insert a new sectional completion, uh, for want of a better description, and allow us to open that stretch, um, which, along with the stretches that are already open, uh, constitutes about 90% of the road by length. Mm. So it, there was no contractual mechanism to allow us to open the road until we'd agreed uh, uh, how to go about that with the lenders and with Transport Scotland. And bear in, in, in mind, Mr Chapman, it's a huge, complex document with dozens of interrelated parties and different advisors, and it just takes a frustrating amount of time for all of us to get things done uh, to amend it. OK, I mean, I hear what you say. I, I, you know, my devious mind makes me think that maybe Maybe you were holding off opening this part of the road as some sort of lever to try and lever in some extra funds from, from the Scottish Government, for instance. That, you know, this was, this was one way that you could say, no, Minister, we, we won't open this section until you agree to, to, to refund some of the extra costs for, for the bridge, for instance. Is that, that, is that, uh, am I... That is definitely not the case. We have right. a very strong vested interest in opening the road whenever we can. Uh, and the, the delays <clears throat> uh, in opening the stretch that we will open next week have cost us four million, I guess, something, four million odd pounds. So we have a very strong interest in opening the road as soon as possible. OK. I, on, on that, can I just add? No, no, you can't. I'm, I'm sorry. The, no, Mr Rumbles, there are other people on the committee and I need to get round them. I will try and bring you in. Jamie, you knew were next and Lewis is after. Th thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, and I'm sorry to press you on, on the issue that Mr Rumble's raised, but I think it's an important point. I'm still not 100% clear on, on this number situation. So can I refer uh, separately uh, to the two organisations represented? First, uh, to Galliford Try, and I'm paraphrasing from the statement you made to investors a few weeks ago. You said that owing to increased complexity in weather delays uh, and a result of higher than t anticipated costs, uh, your uh, estimate of the final cost will have increased by £20 million. Uh, can you be clear to the committee 
if it's your presumption that you will absorb that increase or whether Transport Scotland will? And then I'll move on to my question to Balfour Beatty, which is similar. Um, <clears throat> Galford Tri uh, has, has raised £150 million in the market. That's a, that's a, a statement of facts in the public domain uh, to cover the issues related to this project. That's the scale uh, of the issues on this contract for Galford Tri. Um, the £20 million is, is, is cost, and that is, will be paid by us as our share of the joint venture, uh, and is totally separate to uh, the commercial issues we have with Transport Scotland. There's cost on one side, which is cost and claim uh, or entitlement on the other side. But will so, you be seeking to recover any of that from Transport Scotland? Well, there is a claim whether directly, whether it directly applies. But in other words, whether additional costs may have, for example, been for the Don Bridge. So, in that case, it doesn't apply. That's our cost. If, uh, but separately to that, there might be other costs as part of our claim, which we'll be seeking to recover. So you will be seeking to recover some of those losses? If it's, if it's related to, if it's related to uh, elements of our claim. Certainly. And do you know how much, sorry? Uh, well, no, those, are, those discussions are commercial. Okay. Are commercially okay. okay, can I move on to Balfour Beatty then, in, in respect to a statement that you made uh, in the notes we have. This, this is in August of this year, and you said that uh, in the first six months of the year, presumably 2018, Balfour Beatty recognised an additional £23 million loss on the AWPR project. Uh, first point is £23 million on top of what existing loss? So what is the total loss? And bear in mind that was August, now we're in December. Could you give us an update on to your estimated total loss on the AWR project? But then, more worryingly, you go on to say uh, that this loss represents a net charge made up of cost increases on the project, partially offset by recovery positions that the group believe are highly probable to be agreed. Can you explain what are the recovery positions that your group believes are highly probably to be agreed? And, and on a similar vein to my previous question, will you be seeking to recover any of that loss from Transport Scotland? And if so, how much? Okay. Um, just if I just pick up on the last point about the highly probable, that, that essentially relates to an accounting standard. And it's a test you have to satisfy uh, in order to uh, to back the judgments that you're you're making, um, I think if I just just unwind slightly, and, and then I'll come back to your question, uh, Mr. Green, if I may. Um, th there is no doubt that, and it's on record, we have incurred significant additional costs on this contract in trying to mitigate um, the delays that have been caused. Um, and whilst you know we we, we recognise how important this route is to the people of North East Scotland. Um, had we not taken some of these mitigation measures, the road would have been delayed um, you know, longer than, than it currently is. So there are significant costs that run into the hundreds of millions. So these are not small sums, they're material. Um, they contributed to Korean insolvency, um, not exclusively, but they contributed to it. Uh, and it's placed an additional burden on Gulliver Tri and Balfour Beatty uh, because of the joint and several obligations that we carry um, under, under the contract. Um, so we have had to trade uh, losses uh, as, as, as we foresaw them within our uh, financial statements. Um, and we have had, uh, in the same way that Gallifer Tri had to go to the market to raise finance to fund their share of losses, we have had to dispose of assets in order to fund our share of losses on the contract. So we're in a situation as of today where the joint venture partners are hundreds of millions uh, out of pocket as a consequence of the work we've been doing on Aberdeen. Separately, we have a claim um, for a not insignificant sum uh, that we are in discussions with Transport Scotland over. Uh, those discussions uh, are progressing in a consensual way to try to find a way of resolving uh, the issues um, between us. Um, and those discussions continue. Um, and there are judgments that we make as to where we think those um, discussions will, will finally um, sit. And those are, uh, you'll understand, those are judgments that are um, commercially sensitive. Um, but that, I'm hoping that just contextualises... It, it does, it does, but before you move on, and I appreciate your, your forthcomingness, and I, and I appreciate the situation you're in, and, and the fact that you're, you know, committed to get this road open as quickly as possible for the benefit of 
the people who use it. And I do, I do appreciate that, and that is welcome. But this committee has a, a duty as well. You know, we were told that this project would cost £745 million. The panel is telling us that this, there are hundreds of millions of pounds worth of overruns, but it's entirely unclear where the liability for those overruns lie and how much of that will rest on the public purse. And that's a, it's a very simple question, and I don't think we, we, we have any further uh, uh, conclusion to the question, I'm afraid. No, and I don't, but regrettably, I don't think I can answer that question the way that you might like. All I can say is that we, um, it's a, a material, um, you know, serious financial uh, situation that we're in. Um, there are some things that will be to our account. Um, you know, we carry risks, as we discussed earlier, under the contract. Um, if we get those judgments wrong, that, that's to our account. Where there is are legitimate risks that we believe are retained by the public sector, then the contract provides for how those issues are addressed um, through, you know, through, through the contract and the various you know, hierarchies of, um, of dealing with those, uh, those issues. Um, so we, we are in, you know, I, I mean, it's uncertain for us um, at the moment because we don't know the outcome um, of, those, of the commercial discussions that we're in uh, with Transport Scotland. So I can tell you it's not a very comfortable feeling on, on this side of the table. Lewis, can you, uh, you'd like to you Char, can you uh, simply indicate whether your claim against Transport Scotland is in the tens of millions or the hundreds of millions? Um, that's not something that I would want to answer um, here um, because of the commercial nature of the discussions that we're having. If I was to put to you that the total cost of the project is over a billion pounds, you would accept that that's broadly correct? Um, yes, I think from what we've said, you could deduce that those are the areas of the um, cost. Th th thank you very much. S the other point, I guess, following on from colleagues, is that uh, the Minister was very critical of Peter Truscott when he made a statement in Parliament uh, on the 1st of November and said that uh, ARL had indicated, uh, or Mr Truscott had indicated, that uh, the contract variation was with the lenders, and, and then a couple of days later uh, he received a letter saying that uh, no such con conversations had taken place, uh, and clearly since then the contractors have been accused of holding the government to ransom. I wonder, Mr Hawking, if you would comment on those points. Yeah. Well, the first thing to say is that <clears throat> Peter Truscott is, a, is an honourable, decent man, and he spoke in good faith when he spoke to the minister uh, on the, on the 20, was it 29th, I forget the date now, uh, 29th uh, of October. Um, so uh, what, what Peter was unaware of was that over the weekend we'd had some issues again with the Don Bridge, and that those issues meant that um, there was a... Uh, undefined delay uh, to the Don, and until we could understand uh, the nature of that and un assess the impact, uh, it, we couldn't send anything off, off to the funders. And uh, so, so Peter, if I can just finish that, Peter then reported back to the, the joint venture, <clears throat> and as soon as we realised that, uh, that that was the issue, we wrote to the minister the same day, or went the next day possibly, I can't remember, uh, to, put a, to set the record straight. That, that's, those are the facts of the matter. But, but nonetheless, it's still taken a further month to agree a contract variation which, in principle, had been accepted before the end of October? Well, it, had, it, had, it hadn't been accepted at the end of October. It had, it had, we'd had got pretty close, to be fair, but there are um, small I's to dot and T's to cross, and as I said earlier on, it's a hugely compact, complex and interrelated <coughs> document, and every time anything small changes, it goes off in all directions to all sorts of advisors for, for their viewpoints and come back. So, regrettably, it does take longer than we all would would like, absolutely. And I said earlier on that we have a very strong vested interest in getting the road open at the, at the earliest opportunity. So we were going, uh, you know, full steam to try to achieve that. Can you indicate what concession the government made that enabled you to reach that agreement uh, today? I, I don't think it was a concession. I think that, um, in fact, the, the government held firm on some of the issues that, that, um, that, that, that we wanted to in, uh, insert regarding uh, various mechanisms. Um, and. Uh, on the, I've got the dates here somewhere. On the 19th, um, sorry, yes, on the 19th, we received the minister's final stance uh, on the documents. On the 20th, our legal advisers reviewed the documents, and on a conference call on the, at Hoppo State on the 21st, we resolved to send the documents to the lenders. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, just before I go on, Michael Matheson's comment that the contractors have not been entirely straight on this matter is completely untrue. You, were, you have been entirely straight. Absolutely. Peter spoke in good faith. Okay. Uh, Mark, you wanted to ask a question. Yeah, I just wanted to get a, a head around the timelines here. So the contract variation that, that has now been agreed was first discussed 
when? Was that October that was first discussed in terms of varying the contract to enable the section to be open? No, it's, it's prior to that. Uh, I mean, it's, it's worth saying the contract variation uh, that, that is now sort of agreed and will be put into action for, uh, following, following today, the, the lender's consent last night, was a, was a concept proposed by the contractors. It was a variation, uh, and that really came about following uh, when the delays in the, the Don Crossing manifested in, in the proper way back in, in sort of uh, the summer this year. So uh, the, the process, it's worth saying that it's a comp it's a really complex set of contractual structure that's here. There's a huge number of parties. There's three shareholders in the ARL. There's two, two parties in the construction joint venture. You've got uh, the government, which is a number of parties at the other side of the contract. The lenders must give a consent. There's five, there's five lenders. There's a lender's technical advisor. You know, uh, there's, the, the suite of contracts goes into thousands of pages, many schedules. It's not quite a straightforward thing. The, the first part of that is, is a negotiation between the key parties, ARL, the contractors and the government, uh, which was just completed in October and following that date. But the, the last piece of the jigsaw, going back to that, is, is the lender's consent, which we've been in con continual dialogue with our lenders, but we can't actually send the formal contracts till we've reached commercial agreement at the top level. So it, it is just like a, a really... It's a, sp a spider's web of contracts, and it's, okay. it's a very complex sort of arrangement. Okay. Well, well, that perhaps leads nicely on to my, my question, which is directed to, to Mr. Tarr. And it, um, in June, um, the Balfour BT half-year results, the Group Chief Executive's review, um, it states, um, part of AWPR is already open to the public. That refers to the Balmedi to Park Hill uh, section, uh, with the majority of the routes scheduled to open by the end of August. Um, completion of the new remaining bridge is expected in the autumn. So in, in June of this year, Balfour Beatty's chief executive was advising shareholders that the piece of work that was necessitated by a contract variation was expected in August. So I guess my question is, if what Mr Love is saying about the complexity of seeking a uh, variation to the contract is widely accepted, why were Balfour Beatty shareholders being advised that they should anticipate that section being open at the end of August? when the likelihood and the reality is now that it's taken some three months, about well, three and a half months longer than that for it to happen? Um, I think at that time, uh, we did anticipate um, reaching an agreement which would allow PTU2B, as we term it, uh, to be opened in, um, um, I think, the end of, end of August. In fact, the road was con the, the construction of the road, so the actual physical road, um, the certificate was submitted in, I think, the 16th of August. Um, at so, so the road was actually um, physically largely mm -hmm. complete um, in August. Um, the issue has been, as, as Brian has described, the, uh, the issues over actually formally uh, getting an agreement with Transport Scotland over the terms of that, um, that variation. Um, and I think on the bridge, um, you know, we're... Um, uh, we didn't know that we were going to have the further problems I described in October, uh, which has served to push it from sort of um, a November completion, as we thought, uh, into um, this month. So, uh, and we're still, as I described earlier, pushing to try to get that finished uh, by the end of this month. But you, but you can understand that when those comments were yeah. reported, that led to, you know, people expectation. Expe expectation. Yeah. And do you, do you regret that perhaps there hasn't been better expectation management, in particular um, highlighting what the issues are that, that the project has faced, because that has led, I think, to unhelpful speculation and um, suggestions around major uh, problems with the Don Bridge, um, which I, I don't think have been successfully uh, countered by, by yourselves in terms of your responses um, prior to today. Okay. Uh, you, I think maybe that was a statement more than a question. That, that's how I interpreted it, but it's... It, if, you, if you feel that you could have perhaps done more to, to share information in advance of today's meeting okay, about what the issues with the just, just before you answer that question, I've got to do some expectation management as well in the sense that we, we are still on question one and there may be more than one question. And uh, I, I've got people queuing up, so... Maybe we could, we, Mark, if, if we could part that question, I'm going to bring um, 
Mike rumbles in with a binary quest, a question requiring a binary answer, and then I'm going to go to John, and then I'm going to Maureen. I would like just a yes or a no answer to this. Very simple question. I want to know if you've been given any indication that your claims for more taxpayers' money over and above the fixed-term contract would be looked on favourably if you would just open the road between Stonehaven and West Hill. Yes or no? No. Mr. No. Tart? No. OK. Um, John, it's you on question two, and then Maureen. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, We've concentrated mainly, I think, on the technical side so far, but you've mentioned Carillion as well. So I was just really wondering if you could explain, you know, really how much impact did the collapse of Carillion have? You know, was it minor hiccup or was it much more major than that? Oh. Uh, uh, from a practical pers perspective, it disrupted our operations <clears throat> insofar as uh, Carillion were one third of the joint venture. Um, they obviously provided one third of the working capital to finance the joint venture, and <clears throat> broadly they provided one third of the staff. Uh, it's not an exact split, but uh, broadly. So, <clears throat> so when Carillion uh, became insolvent, uh, the remaining two parties, as Steve said earlier on, are jointly and severally bound, so we have an obligation to continue the contract. Uh, we employed the vast majority of the Carillion staff to ensure continuity. We took on the obligations to pay uh, subcontractors between the two of us as opposed to between the three of us, for example. And so we believe we mitigated the effect of Carillion's insolvency as best we could. Um, there's inevitably, inevitably some disruption when half of the staff all of a sudden uh, are concerned about their, their futures and so on. So, but well, I, th was, I think we did a, a reasonable job of that. Was that an unusual model that you were jointly and severally liable no, for no, each it's, other? No, it's normal for joint ventures. Yes, because we got the impression that down south there was projects where Carillion, but maybe that was on their own, the, the project just stopped when Carillion collapsed. They, they were on their own on, in those projects, yeah. Right, OK. I think in all so, situations <clears throat> where they were operating in joint ventures, the joint venture partner stepped in yeah. in a similar way that um, Gallifrey Tri and SL stepped in um, to take on the staff, because you'll understand it was quite a stressful time um, for those for the employees of um, Carillion um, at the time. So our, the ability to be able to offer them continued employment mm -hmm. um, on the scheme served our purpose and, and resolved their uncertainty. So. And, and so how does it work? Once a section is opened and um, the, the, the money starts flowing, does some of that money go to Carillion's liquidators for the work they did? No. Under the joint venture agreement um, <clears throat> on insolvency, Carillion are excluded from the joint venture. So at that point in time, they, they just cease to be a partner in the joint venture, which regrettably means they don't take their share of the losses. Beyond the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I assume they wouldn't be taking their share of the losses, but, but the work they had done, has anyone, does anyone get paid for that? It's an integrated team. Yeah. So, so the way the joint venture works... Um, there isn't work that Carillion does, that Balfour does, that Gallifrey try. It's one team delivering the whole of the works, um, and you have a financial interest in the outcome of the project. So your interest is, is, is a financial percentage interest in the outcome of the, of the contract. That's how the model works. So, sorry, I'm, I'm not understanding this. So, I mean, they had paid their staff up till whenever the date was, and they had not had any money for that because it was only when the road section opened that money started flowing. And no, there's a, there's a, there's a, con, the, there's a um, because this is a um, NFD model. Would you want to... it's, an, it's an NPD model. So the, the contract that the construction joint venture are undertaking is with Aberdeen Roads Limited. Yes. Aberdeen Roads Limited pays the construction joint venture. Those payments are made sort of monthly uh, on milestones of works completed. Those payments are funded by debt we raise. The unitary right. charge, once the road is open, the unitary charge flows to Aberdeen Roads Limited. Aberdeen Roads Limited use that money to repay the debt it's borrowed to fund the construction. OK, I get that. So, therefore, Carillion had been paid for the work they'd done Correct. Uh, up to the time of closure. OK, I think that's enough. Thanks. Yep. Before we leave Carillion, can you just confirm to me that when, that when they went uh, out of business, that there was, there was going to be no foreseen delay as a result of that. I mean, you were still happy that when Carillion ceased trading that you'd still open on time. Um, well, I think, as I said, there was some disruption around Carillion's insolvency. You know, the second biggest contract in the UK disappearing wasn't a, a small uh, event. 
Uh, so, so specifically, you pinning, specifically pinning that to any delay, I, I would say no. It was a reality which we dealt with. So, so th them going bankrupt didn't affect the opening time? Not significantly, I wouldn't have said, because we took on most of their staff within a few weeks I think the, uh, of, of them being bust. The issue, I think, was more the uncertainty created within the supply chain as well, because Carillion had uh, firms um, that were owed money um, by, by Carillion. So, so you had those some disrupted. The timing, of course, it was January, February, um, so in the winter months when, you know, by... Um, you know, the, the project wasn't in the full flow it would be during um, the summer months. Um, so we were able to, to mitigate the impact of um, Carillion's insolvency. OK, thank you. Uh, Maureen, finally, I'm afraid it's you now on question three. <laughs> thank you, convener. Uh, my constituency runs from Muckles through Netherley, Mary Cooter, Peter Cooter, uh, right up virtually to the Langstrath. So you can see that the majority of the roads... Uh, and right round to Wellington uh, Road and the D. So we can see that the majority of the road is in my constituency. We've talked about the effect of Carillion and the effect of uh, utility companies. Can I turn to Storm Frank? Because obviously uh, on the D there was widespread flooding around where the bridge is and there's continued concern uh, of residents of... Uh, Peter Cooter about how the bridge uh, and the foundations and everything have uh, affected and are going to affect um, the, the, the river flow in, in the future. So did Storm Frank make you revisit uh, any of the, the drainage uh, around the works uh, on AWPR? Not that I'm aware of, no. Um, the, the bridge over the D would have been designed for a 100-year storm event, and um, the foundation was set well back from the riverbanks. They, they piled on very deep piles. So, no, I think the short answer is that the design um, stands as it, as it is. I can check that, but I'm pretty sure that that is the case. But the, pile, the piles do go into the rock um, in that area, so whatever happens, uh, the water level... And, and it was a very severe storm, as, as, as your constituents will know. Um, so it impacted our works, um, but um, we don't anticipate it impacting the design of the permanent works uh, once constructed. Yeah, I mean, there is still some concern in the communities that they haven't seen uh, what the flood management system is around that part uh, of the D in future. And I think, you know, all of you, as I understand it, are feeding into this, and it would be helpful if, if uh, we could reassure residents, if you like, um, in, in the very near future. I wonder if you could, could perhaps see to that. The other thing that I want to mention is, obviously, a large number of my constituents have been affected uh, by the road. And I would like, uh, where you have uh, taken over pieces of land and now don't require them anymore, can I urge you to make sure that the handing them back in the, in the proper uh, condition, if you like, is done as, as quickly as possible. And to, because, you know, many residents have, in the meantime, their circumstances have changed, they'll be wanting to sell their house. So um, can I get a guarantee that that will be done as quickly as possible? Who wants to answer that? Bill? Certainly. We'll take that back to the site team and make sure that that is done as soon as possible. Uh, we, are in the, and we are in the process of reinstating a lot of the areas we've used as temporary standings and that sort of thing. I mean, if there, is, if there are any circumstances that you've been made aware of where you think we've not um, delivered on what you'd expect us to deliver on, then we'd be happy to hear that. I mean, you will know that I have <laughs> written to you on umpteen occasions, and I have to say um, that I have really had a very good response uh, in terms of that, and uh, where I have raised issues on behalf of constituents. But there is this thing about once the whole road is open, there's a thing about a year and a day if you've got any claims, isn't there? So if anybody's affected by noise or something that wasn't foreseen or something, there's a you can have a claim in... Uh, you can put a claim in a year and up to a year and a day after the, the road is open. Is that correct? Um, 
Sorry, I, I think I may be able to help slightly on that. I think that's a compensation claim which is dealt with by Transport Scotland. I don't think it's dealt with by the contractor. And you're entirely right. There are, um, I'm talking as in my days as a surveyor, where there are statutory timescales which are very, very important. So maybe that's something we could take up with the Cabinet Secretary um, at the next session. Okay, that's fine. Thank, Thank you. you, Maureen. Um, I think the next question... Um, is Colin a, a very brief one? I think. I, I think. I think to be fair, it's probably been answered. But uh, just so we can place it on, on record, you've indicated in the last 24 hours you've received permission from funders to open the last stretch of, of the road. So you're given an absolute cast iron guarantee to this committee that the road will be fully functioning by Christmas. Let's be categorical about the wording. We've received uh, consent to the wording from the funders, which allows the process of. In other words, there's no further issues with the with the word with the drafting to be to be done. All that remains now, and Brian confirm is that to append a, a covering letter to the agreed yes. drafting and get everybody to sign it. So, uh, and on that basis, we we have a high degree of confidence. Yes, and we've uh, already started conversations with Transport Scotland uh, about the logistics of opening that section of the road. Right. Yeah, it, it's just to be quite clear about your Christmas date there. So that the phase we're talking about is from Stonehaven to Crabston in Charleston. Yeah. So it's the sub-phase that's required through the variation. The lender's consent in, in, in principle has been a, uh, achieved. We need to opine a legal opinion around enforceability, which will be done this week and uh, is getting done as we sit here at the moment. We then move into discussions with uh, Transport Scotland and the police around the, old, the road opening. The Christmas date is related to the Dawn Bridge. Uh, I think Steve's already covered that uh, the, the contractor is targeting a date prior to Christmas for the opening of the Dawn Bridge. That construction programme uh, is subject to many things, uh, notably weather. So adverse weather could throw that out. So that date is not cast in stone yet. So you're not able to give a, a specific date when the full road will be, will be functioning? Well, what you're saying is a section from Stone, Stonehaven to Crabston and Charleston by the end of next week. And then <clears throat> we're targeting uh, before Christmas for the Don Bridge and the rest of the road. That's from Crabston to Govel. Um, as Brian said, uh, the final uh, parts of that bridge construction are weather susceptible. So um, it, 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 it may be impacted by weather. And, and just briefly, you've indicated in previous questioning you've not received anything at all from the Scottish Government to open part of, of the road next week. So what exactly were your meetings with ministers all about? What did you discuss if you've not actually received anything to, to open that part of the road next week? I don't understand. Well, that's that's uh, what we've been discussing, is opening that road, part of that road next week. Sorry? I don't understand the question. I'm well, you, you've indicated in, in response to what Mike Rumble's asked that you've not received anything at all from the government um, effectively to open that part of the road next week. So you've had discussions with Scottish government ministers. What were those discussions specifically about then if, if you've not received anything from the Scottish government? My interpretation of Mr Rumble's question was that um, had we received any uh, favourable uh, view of our claim on the back of opening the road, and the, question, the answer to that was no. Uh, on, on the back of opening <clears throat> the section of the road, we will start to get the unitary charge that Brian mentioned earlier on. So that proportion of the road um, that is open, we will start to be paid uh, next week. As soon as the road is open, we will start to get paid for that section of the road. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, Jamie, I think yours is the next question. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, can I just quickly check, Mr Love, uh, does Aberdeen Roads Limited currently have or plan to issue any claims against the Scottish Government? Uh, so the way the claim structure works under the contracts is uh, we have the lead contract with the Government, uh, we have the subcontract with the construction joint venture. Uh, the claim is sort of what's referred to as a common ground claim. So the claim comes from the construction joint venture through Aberdeen Roads onto the Government. It's all wrapped up in one claim process. And, and so the claims that the, the two other organisations represented will go through your That's correct, organisation? Yes. That's correct. So it's fair to say that all three members of the panel this morning will have a claim against the Scottish Government? Technically, the claim against the Scottish Government is from Aberdeen Roads Limited. The, the construction joint venture have that claim against Aberdeen Roads Limited. But the way the contracts work, it's called a common ground claim, project, equivalent project relief, and it's wrapped up in one process. Right, OK. Uh, I, and, and for commercial reasons, we don't know the value of those claims yeah, at the moment. Be, but we can only estimate, given the conversation we've just had, that it's somewhere between 10 and, goodness knows, £300 million. Pounds. How would you characterise your relationship with the Scottish Government at the moment? Uh, 
The relationship with the Scottish Government has been professional throughout the, the process. I mean, I was involved in the project through bid phase and through the construction phase. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it, there's no secret there's been some challenges and there's been some frank exchange of views, as you'd expect. Both parties have uh, protected as far as they can their commercial positions, but the, the relationship, is, is dialogue has continued throughout and it's remained professional throughout. So professional is, is, is helpful, but... You know, we have a, a transport minister who's made some, some quite serious comments in the public domain about some of the stakeholders represented at the table here. Uh, there are some legal, uh, potential legal cases in terms of recovery of costs or, or overruns coming down the pipeline. Uh, the project is delayed by an undefined period of time and over budget by an undefined period of money. Uh, professional is one word to describe it, but Realistically, you know, how, how much comfort should the public take in your ability to have an ongoing 30-year management and maintenance relationship with the Scottish Government, given the state of affairs at the moment? Um, <clears throat> I would say in response to that, Mr Green, that um, uh, the remaining two parties of the joint venture have diligent, diligently and professionally and honourably executed the project under very, very difficult circumstances which we've described. <coughs> and next week, we will hand over 37 odd kilometres of road uh, to the people of the North East. Uh, all the feedback we've had so far on the, those stretches that have been opened is that it's uh, a very good quality and that people are delighted with the impact it has on their journey times and reliability and so on. Um, so we are actually proud of what we've achieved in the face of such adversity. And I know that there's some difficulty about it, but um, uh, I would like to thank all the women and men almost 15,000 of them, actually, that worked on the AWPR over the last few years for their tenacity and resilience in getting this job finished. Mm. Uh, and that's very welcome, and, and, and I think that's probably shared by, by many of us uh, at the end of the day, that people on the ground are delivering the project and, and, and those employment opportunities equally are, are welcome. But we, we have the Transport Minister come in to present to the committee shortly after uh, you leave. And quite frankly, uh, when questions have been asked of this project in the chamber, the blame has been put fairly and squarely on the three uh, gentlemen in front of us today. Uh, what would you say to the Transport Minister, given the opportunity in that respect? Um, well, we can't speak for Mr Matheson um, or his predecessor. Uh, all we would say is that I would echo Brian's comment that our, our exchanges with the government and with Transport Scotland have been professional. Yes, they've been robust at times, but they've been professional. That's, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I, 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 I think that's probably a, a, a good comment to, to end that on because Stuart's got a question and then Mike and then we've got a question from Peter and, and one more. So, Stuart. It's just to confirm that uh, the overruns in constructing are a matter for the people sitting at the bottom. The claims relate solely uh, to utilities. Yes, but it's, uh, the two are inextricably linked because the, uh, the issues with utilities have led to delays and disruption to the execution of the works. Um, but, but, but just to be clear, that if this is just an arbitrary choice, laying a kilometre of tarmac cost you 20% more than you had put in your original budget, that's for you to pay for. Did. But if that increase was caused by utility diversion, that can be part of the discussion you're continuing to have. Yes. So, so I'm just wanting to be clear, the, the word overruns has a danger of being more comprehensive than I think it is actually. If I, just, if I take your example of the, of the kilometre, if we had to build that kilometre in three sections at different times, that, you'll understand, is more disruptive than doing one kilometre in one go. And I think that probably characterises some of the issues that we are um, trying to resolve with, um, with, with Transport Scotland. But it is solely about utility. The only thing that, uh, the only claim we have is related to uh, the utilities um, and our ability to demonstrate the consequential impacts of that and, and not those things for which we carry and retain That's responsibility. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mike and then Peter. Just for the parliamentary record, um, when I asked earlier the question, I want to know if you've been given any indication that your claim for more taxpayers' money will be looked on favourably if you would just open the road. I heard Mr Hocking and Mr Tarr give say no. 
I didn't hear uh, what Mr. Love said, and I could just wonder, for the record, just could you just answer that yes or no to that question? Yeah, my answer to that question is also no. Thank you very much. Okay. Peter, your question. Yeah, um, you know, based on your experience of this AWPR project, do you have concerns about the Scottish Government's non-profit distributing model for, for financing these? I mean, would you, would you, be, would you be content to, to enter into a new contract under similar, uh, under a similar regime? So, so profusely at that, it's going to be you that's going to answer that first. Well, well, um, <laughs> well we may have to lick our wounds for a bit, but um, I think um, the, the, the model is fundamentally sound, and it's used in schools and hospitals and so on without any issue. And I think that's because there are smaller, more defined, more manageable projects. Um, and there's nothing to say that that's not a, the correct model for this type of scheme. I, I would personally, it's my personal view, uh, say that the risk-reward balance is out of kilter. Um, so um, that, that's what I'd say. The model itself works, uh, provided the risk-reward balance is, is balanced. So basically what you're saying, that too much of the risk falls on your shoulders rather than, than, the, than the Scottish Government's shoulders. Is that, is that what you mean? Well, I, I, it's up to every contractor to decide what amount of risk they prepare to stomach. So I'm not I'm not laying the blame anywhere. I'm saying that uh, the contractors went into the contract willingly, no enforcement to sign it. Um, but I personally think that it's uh, that the risk reward balance is, is wrong. And and so simplistically put, to bid another scheme like this, um, I personally would be much more risk averse, which would mean that the likelihood is I wouldn't win the project in the first place. Or you, or you, or you might put in a, a slightly higher uh, uh, cost as your as your. Uh, for the first, uh, in the first process, you might, you might say uh, you, know, you're, you wouldn't be quite so keen in your, in your costings. Absolutely. Just, just one, uh, one final thing before. Just, I mean, there's still, there's still uh, remedial works to be carried out. Let's hope the road opens before Christmas, but there will still be remedial works to carry out. And one of the main ones that I, I get regularly brought up by the farmers along the, the route is drainage works. There are still a lot of drainage works to be completed. I mean, can they? Can our? Can my farmer friends have, have confidence that you will, uh, you know, be a bit around for for long enough to make sure that all these drainage issues are sorted? Satisfied? Yes, I can. Before you do that, Peter, if you're going to talk about farming, yeah, you need I, to declare an interest. I need interest. to declare an interest as, as, a, as a, a, a partner in a farming business uh, in Aberdeenshire, but not connected to the road. I will, I will add. But I, you know, I'll, many farmers have contacted me with many issues, but the one that's still very much outstanding is drainage issues, and I specifically ask about that. There's, there's, so the, the projected this, uh, December date we're working to now is for the, the main highway, the main road section to open. There is some ancillary works to go on beyond that date, uh, which are, but you're obviously not on uh, the, the main road, so that will continue, and uh, we're projecting for March for those works. Aberdeen Roads has, a, as uh, Mr Green has pointed out, a 30-year concession uh, to operate this road. Uh, we have uh, a, con a contractual structure where if a, a defect manifests itself, uh, whether it be in drainage or in ancillary works, we can uh, uh, seek the construction joint venture uh, to make those corrections. So, yeah, I can, I can provide those assurances that Aberdeen Roads Limited will be around for uh, the foreseeable future, yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank and you. we're going to part that out because I've got two more questions which I'd like to get in before my final one. Richard, if, it, if it's brief, please. Uh, my, my question is, uh, I've had experience of uh, you know, exactly what you've done. The M8, M73, M74 was the same type of bundle in my constituency. What I found it was too, the, the contract was too tight and there wasn't enough flexibility. Is that where the problems have arisen and, and you're where the, there's not enough flexibility to to amend some of the contracts, you've got to go through all the, the people. It is a very rigid form of contract, <clears throat> that is for sure. Um, I was pleased to see a couple of weeks ago, though, there was a, a publication saying that the, the government was considering different forms of procurement um, for infrastructure schemes and building schemes on a, on a, on a slightly different uh, form of contract. So that's, that's a... Yeah, and on, on the subject of uh, upgrade or restoration or whatever, yeah, actually the company who's running this is going to be there for the next 30 years anyway. Yes. yes. And will be responsible for any problems. Yes. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Uh, Maureen, a very short one, please. Yeah, I too would like to thank everybody who's worked on the project. I think it looks fantastic. Um, 
Can I just ask what lessons you've learned from this project for future projects? And it, it, is it the case that you grossly underbid for the contract? Steve said, <clears throat> um, where we have um, un underpriced things, that is for our account. Uh, we, we focused on finishing the job in its entirety, the section next week, and then the whole job, uh, hopefully by Christmas. Uh, and then we'll review our own shortcomings and the lessons that we'll learn. Um, and uh, I suggest we'll also sit down with Transport Scotland and, and have a debate about uh, joint lessons which could be learned for future projects. I would just make one point, which is around um, your point about did we underbid uh, contract and my understanding is that two bidders um, who went to what's called best and final um, were, were quite close. Um, mine, mine is, a, 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 I think, is going, now going to be the final question. So my question is uh, on subcontractors that you've used. Um, the, the problem is, as I see it, is the contract is cost or is is programmed to cost 745 million and by your i think stephen's comment it, it may well have cost over a billion pounds by the time it's all complete i have evidence of of on the a9 the dalradi to kill kin craig section where subcontractors have not been paid because the joint venture has said well we're not paying you the full amount we'll just pay you what it thinks it's worth and there's a couple of cases where that's in arbitration can you give me a guarantee or the committee a guarantee that the subcontractors who've done work in good faith and completed the work up to the required standard will be paid in full despite the claims that you have against the government yes absolutely yes i think work our supply chain um, is really important to us we treat them in the way um, that we expect to be treated by, um, by Transport Scotland. We have actually closed out over 60% by value of the subcontract orders um, that we've placed. Um, and those are consensual um, negotiations uh, to, close, uh, to close out. Um, okay. So we don't envisage um, any um, material issues with our supply chain in resolving our differences. The issues we have with Transport Scotland are separate from the way in which we've contracted with our supply chain. I mean, it's good to hear that because often the, the bigger organisation squeezes the smaller organisation and it is those smaller organisations who, who really feel the pinch. So I'm pleased to hear that. Thank you very much for coming and giving evidence uh, this morning. Um, it, it's been very interesting from our point of view to hear um, a bit more pieces uh, to the story. Um, so I'd like to thank you and I'd like to now briefly suspend the meeting to allow a changeover of witnesses. Could I ask committee members please to make sure you're back at 20 past 10 in your seats, please.
Uh, welcome back. We are now moving on to agenda item three, which is a transport update. This forms a regular update from the Scottish Government to the committee as part of its scrutiny of transport policy. This is the first of our regular transport update ses sessions with the new Cabinet Secretary for Transport Infrastructure and Connectivity. An update on the National Transport Strategy was provided by the Cabinet Secretary via correspondence on Monday. Uh, I have already welcomed Lewis MacDonald and Mark MacDonald, who are going to stay with us for the first part of this item. Uh, I'd like to welcome from the Scottish Government, Michael Matheson, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity, Bill Reeve, the Director of Rail, Michelle Rennie, the Director of Major Transport Infrastructure Projects, Graham Laidlaw, the Head of Ferries, Gary Cox, the Head of Aviation, and Cabinet Secretary, I would like to invite you to make a brief opening statement of up to three minutes. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. I'd like to thank the Committee for inviting me to provide my first general transport update as Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity. Uh, Sunday sees a huge step uh, towards promised changes to ScotRail's timetable across the country, with peak times capacity being improved. Uh, this first phase of Revolution in Rail will also deliver enhanced rail connectivity across the country and improve passenger journey choice. Uh, these changes bring to fruition uh, many tangible benefits of our significant investment in improving rail connectivity and journey times across most of Scottish routes. We are taking a strategic approach to our islands and international connectivity. I have commissioned an aviation strategy to better articulate our commitment to support the economic growth which the aviation sector can help deliver. I am also taking stock in our approach to how we fund and procure ferry infrastructure. Our current ferries plan is under review. On the whole, ferry and aviation services perform well, but I do acknowledge the frustration of customers during recent periods of disruption. Lifeline ferry services and islands aviation routes play a key role in supporting the economic, social and cultural development of islands and remote mainland communities. The Scottish Government remains committed to those services. Let me now turn to the AWPR. Uh, following a session the committee held earlier with the contractors for this project. The only reason that the AWPR is not open today is the technical issues on the Dawn Crossing. ARL uh, aims to finish the bridge before Christmas, but also, uh, but also warned that, that remedial works are complex, very weather sensitive and subject to safety and quality tests. Uh, and we should therefore treat this programme with some caution. Meanwhile, I'm delighted following an intensive period of dialogue with ARL, that it's finally provided a timescale for opening the next 31.5 kilometres. I made clear to ARL, ARL my strong desire to get the road open as soon as possible and that this could not be at any cost and Scottish ministers are simply not willing to pay over the odds for the road on account of mistakes or miscalculations of the contractors making. I'm pleased ARL appear to have now recognised this. Having said that, it is disappointing my personal intervention was required to, remove, to move this matter forward. I question why it's taken ARL this long to release these benefits to the North East when the road had been ready to open on October the 5th. I will end my comments there, Convener, and more than happy to answer questions from committee members. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And the first question will be from Richard Lyle. Richard. Yes. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. When you build a new road, the first question is, when's it going to be opened? My view has always been that it will be open when it's open. But most people want a date, so can you provide an update on the completion and opening date of the AWPR, including the opening of the completed Crabston to Stonehaven section? We want a date. We don't want spring, Christmas. We want a date. So you've just heard from the contractors who are responsible for completing the works which are outstanding on the AWPR. They expect the section 2B uh, open by next week. Um, uh, by the end of next week, and they anticipate having the sections on the bridge over the River Don completed by Christmas. Uh, they weren't able to give you a specific date uh, as to when the works on the River Don will be completed for the reasons which they explained, and as because of the weather sensitivity and some of the technical issues uh, relating to that work. But they intend to have it completed by, uh, by Christmas. Thank you. Okay, and the next question then is from Mike Rumbles. Mike. 
morning, Cabinet Secretary. Your predecessor told us that the fixed price contract for this road uh, was £745 million. Pounds. And the contractors have just told us this morning that this road could actually cost them a billion, up to a billion pounds. So what I'd like to ask you really is how much do you think this fixed price contract is going to cost the taxpayer? Well, as it's set out in the contract as it stands at the present moment, any claim over and above that would have to be substantiated and demonstrated uh, for any additional payments to be made. But as it stands at the present moment, it will be within the the cost that's set out in the contract. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, th thanks for that, um, Cabinet Secretary. Yes, they talked about their claims um, that are going to come forward to you because just looking at their... I mean, they, they claim commercial confidentiality, of course, but looking at their published losses uh, to their shareholders, uh, at least £35 million, uh, that's in the public domain, um, over, the, over the road, that's what they are claiming... Um, can you give us an indication? I mean, if, if, if the fixed price is £745 million and they have said this morning that the whole contract could cost, the whole build could cost up to a billion, how much do you think we are expecting to hear from them in their claims? Is it in the tens of millions? Is it in the hundreds of millions? We, we really just want to know what, their, what you think their claims well, look, will be. Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's, it, it, it should be recognised that in any major infrastructure project, uh, claims being made by contractors um, uh, for a contract of this nature is not unusual. The issue that's then required is for the contractors then to substantiate their claim, to demonstrate the evidence that there's a legitimate additional cost that they have incurred. There's a process for that to be taken forward. Uh, through a, 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 a facilitated dialogue uh, to address these issues. It's then the responsibility of the contractors to produce the evidence to substantiate any additional claim. Any claim being settled will have to be dependent upon the evidence which they're able to submit. So, uh, if any, any final additional costs are incurred by the taxpayer, it would have to be substantiated by evidence and data provided by the contractors that substantiated our need to satisfy any additional costs. Have, have they put any claims in up till now for, the, uh, for this money? So what, what they have done is that they have uh, they've indicated that they have incurred additional costs uh, and that forms part of their claim. They've already been involved in a facilitated dialogue which is part of the contract and part of the contract in dealing with these issues. They've already been involved in that process uh, with the uh, Transport Scotland and our officials in Transport Scotland, including our legal advisors. Um, uh, what they haven't been able to do is to produce the data and the evidence to substantiate that claim as yet. What I'm, what I'm trying to get at is really... Just, I mean, I, I understand you, you couldn't possibly give us the exact figure, but I think people... You know, part of the committee's job is to press you on spending taxpayers' money. Um, we need to give an indication... We need to understand, really... How much taxpayers' money do you think this road is going to cost us? But, well, within, is within the fixed price contract, uh, any additional costs over that will be dependent upon the evidence that's presented by the contractors. But, but so they, they, have, they have submitted claims to you. I'm trying to get but, out from you. What they haven't been able to do is submit data to support ah. those claims sufficiently. So, if you're asking me what will that end figure be, mm -hmm. it is dependent upon the evidence that they're yeah. able to present me, and whether change, it's sufficient. Let me change my question then. Could you tell me whether it's in the area of tens of millions or hundred, that they already submitted claims to you? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give you a figure because they're commercially confidential. Plus, at the same time, um, any, uh, any claim that they may state they have isn't necessarily one that we would say, well, that's just acceptable. That's so who, how much we're prepared to pay. Who would adjudicate so they, between the two of you? Between, sorry? Who would adjudicate on the claim between their claim as an so the client? So there, there is a facilitated discussion process. It's undertaken through uh, a, a, an independent person that's appointed to manage those discussions. They've actually been ongoing. Um, it, it, it could be, ultimately, it would be the courts that would determine these matters mm. so they uh, as well. You, basically. So it could be, it could be through a, a legal process uh, if the facilitated discussion is not able to resolve them. But from my perspective, from a taxpayer's point of view, any additional claim has to be substantiated, and there has to be data to support any such claim. 
The taxpayer can't be in a position where it simply accepts a claim that's lodged by contractors on the basis of what they think they've incurred of additional costs. Now, I'm not saying that they, don't, they may not have a claim. What I'm saying is that to do so, they need to be able to substantiate it and produce the evidence to demonstrate it. And I think from the taxpayer's point of view, that's extremely important. Mm -hmm. So the onus is on them to make sure that they can substantiate any claim. There's a process in the contract to consider these matters. If it can't be dealt with through that process, it may be a process that then has to be dealt with through the courts. I'm not going to give you a figure because this is a matter that could ultimately end up in the courts. But the onus is on the contractors to substantiate any claim which they have. My final question on this then really is, assuming it doesn't go to the courts, because obviously the courts can take an awful long time, so assume that this facilitated discussion reaches an amicable solution, when will the committee be able to find out how much this road has cost the taxpayer? That's dependent upon the contractors being able to substantiate their claim. So the sooner they provide that information and that data, the quicker that assessment can be made. So, Cabinet Secretary, can I clarify just... just so we don't have to push this too far, is that when the final price of the contract is away, you will inform the committee and Parliament how much it's cost over and above the £745 million that the contract if, is If, the, is if there's any additional costs over and above the fixed price contract, Parliament will be notified, and that will have to be a process that's also open to scrutiny from Audit Scotland. Okay. Sorry, Cabinet Secretary, there's a few questions. I, I've just got one, because I, I just... Uh, and I pushed the contractors on it. It started in... Uh, March 2017, it was very much aware that there were huge problems with uh, uh, utilities and Keith Brown came to the committee um, and advised us in March 2017 that all the problems had been resolved, everything was moving forward and the contract was on time. I'm assuming that the Scottish Government then started negotiating almost immediately with the contractor, knowing that there was a problem with utilities, that there would be a cost overrun. Am I right in saying that? Yes or no answer would be fine. Ask Michelle Rennie to answer that because she's been involved in the contract. It predates my involvement in it. She can I, maybe give you a bit more of an insight into that. I felt convinced that. that Michelle would, would be answering that. Michelle, yeah. Um, uh, so, just to clarify, I, I don't... I don't I, I, my recollection isn't that you were told that everything had been resolved with utilities at that point. I think what was what you were told was what the target completion date was. Um, uh, the, without playing out the detail of the contract, the contractor has um, an obligation to manage utilities, um, and uh, our our view is that the contractor's programme is for him to um, design, to manage, to resource and then to deliver. Um, that's the nature of this kind of contract. The, you heard earlier about uh, risk transfer and this is part of the risk transfer as far as we're concerned. Shall in the contract, could you just inform me what the contract says about cost overruns and how long the contractor has to warn the government or Transport Scotland that there is going to be a cost overrun which could result in a claim because that would form part of most contracts? Well, there are... There are uh, in terms of cost overrun, the contractor has no obligation to notify the government of a cost overrun because of the risk transfer mechanism. So just because the contractor incurs a cost, it doesn't necessarily mean the government incurs a cost. In the event, in certain circumstances, the contractor may be entitled to additional costs. In that situation, he would need to evidence his entitlement and he would need to substantiate those costs. Go for that. There is a time scale, yeah. Um, and what, what is that time scale? Um, I, I, can't, I can't tell you off the top of my head what it is, but it, there is a prescribed time scale where they need to notify that they have, um, that, they, that there is a claim of that nature. So, so my question is, is if the problem was identified in March 2017, which was when it was identified, we are now somewhat uh, later than that. We're in December 2018. Surely the contractor would have had to identify what the problem was and notify Transport Scotland of the outline of the claim with it as laid out in the contract. That, that's, that's correct. The, the, notify the contractor, um, we, were, we have been... It's been some time since we've been notified. So when, do you, can, can I push you for a date? Well, uh, 
I can I can write to you and, and, and let you know what the date is. Well, it would, um, be, it would be very helpful because we were told earlier this year that there would be no cost overrun, and I believe that the contractor must have informed you under the contract that there would be a cost overrun by, by, by the time we were given that evidence. Uh, the contractor has identified that he has a claim. The fact that there is a claim does not mean that there is a cost overrun to the government. M Michelle, you and I both understand that, that but if there is a claim, that there is a likelihood that, that that claim will have to be considered. Whether it's rejected or not is, is, is not for either side to, to prejudge. But I think we'll leave it there and I'll move on to uh, Jamie Green, then Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Gavino. Uh, good morning, panel. Uh, I'm quite perplexed, Cabinet Secretary, by, your, by the stance that you and the government are taking on this. What you've just said to the committee is that if there is a claim... Uh, by the contractors. What is important to the taxpayer is that this claim is substantiated by data and evidence and that the onus is on the contractors to provide that. Wouldn't you agree, actually, that what is important to the taxpayer is that they shouldn't be having to foot the bill for cost overruns to the project? And the onus is not on the contractor, but the onus is on you and the Scottish Government to ensure that the Scottish taxpayer is not having to foot the bill for the overruns, which could run into the hundreds of millions of pounds, as we've just heard. I must confess, I'm quite surprised at your question. Um, do, because a contractor has said that they have a claim, you appear to be taking the view that uh, the Scottish Government should just accept that, and it's our, and it's our responsibility. Claim. They seem very confident in their claim. Uh, well, That's the evidence I'm, we took this morning. Well, they may be, uh, and they're entitled to be confident about it as well. I'm confident about our position as well in, the, in acting in taxpayers' interests. If a contractor says that they have a claim, then there's a legitimate process for them to go through in order to deal with that claim. That process will then determine whether there's an entitlement from that. Uh, the onus is on the contractor to demonstrate that. What I'm not going to do is simply say from the taxpayer's point of view, we accept your claim. We'll settle your claim um, on the basis of what you've lodged with us without the necessary evidence and data to support that. Do you think that's going to wash with someone like Audit Scotland or this committee if there's additional costs with it? So I'm very clear with the contractors is that if they have additional cost overruns, which they believe have a claim on, they have to substantiate it. If they substantiate it, it can be considered in the process. I accept, Cabinet Secretary, that there is, there is a substantial risk that there is a claim and elements of that may or may not be valid, the cost of which we don't know is anything from between 10 and £300 million. Pounds. There is an existing risk to the taxpayer. I, I, I don't see how you can ignore that fact. Well, look... It, You've already had a discussion this morning, I heard, you heard from the contractors in terms of risk transfer, on the basis that the risk sits with them because they have entered into a fixed price contract. So the risk rests with them. Anything over and above that has to be going through the substantiated process that I've already set out that is there. What I'm not prepared to do is simply to say that the taxpayers will just take on that risk without them being able to substantiate it. And I think it would be reckless to suggest otherwise. Made my point. I'm sure the committee is not suggesting you're going to be reckless, Cabinet Secretary. Stuart Stevenson and then Lewis. Um, the contractors in the previous ed evidence session uh, confirmed that their claims are limited to the issue of utilities diversion. Um, they also said um, that to part of the substance of their claim related to Transport Scotland having been involved in discussions with the utilities prior to the signing of the contract that ARL are party to. Um, and that therefore they were leading us to a position of concluding that there was some residual risk lay with Transport Scotland in relation to the work that was done prior to the signing of the contract with ARL. My question is simply, is that a shared understanding that you have as described by ARL and the contractors to us, or have you a different view of the basis of the claims? I'm going to, I'm going to bring Michelle Rennie in on this issue, given, uh, given our history with the, with the project. But let me just make this point is that um, there was almost two years spent in developing this contract. Uh, and the companies who, contractors who entered into the contract are multinational, multi-million pound organisations who wanted the contract, who competitively bid for the contract and who wanted to undertake that work. They signed the contract in the full knowledge of where the risks lay within that contract as well. 
They have the legal and technical advisors available to them in their respective organisations. This is not a new process to them. It's a process that's been used in other major construction projects, uh, including on roads and also in building facilities such as schools and hospitals. So it's not a new process to them, but they went into it with their eyes wide open and with all of the knowledge of previous contracts. But I'll ask Michelle Rennie to maybe just give you some more detail about the utilities element of it and some of the risks associated with that. Thank you, Minister. I think it's important to just give you a little bit of background. Um, so, as the Minister says, what we're doing here is not new. It's not new in privately financed projects, it's not new in NPD projects, and actually it's not new in design and build projects for Transport Scotland. How we have treated utilities here is exactly the same as we treat utilities across all of our projects. Projects which Morrisons and Balfour Beatty have been involved in and have successfully delivered across Scotland for a number of years. Throughout, the, um, throughout the, the bidding process, there's a period of competitive dialogue. In order for utility companies to be ready, some of them need longer lead times than others, depending on the nature of the utility. Um, we engage with those utility companies very early in the design of the scheme so that we know what utilities we're likely to encounter and know what challenges that we're going to face. We also continue that involvement right through the tendering, the dialogue process, and we make that process transparent to contractors. In fact, we create a situation where we are happy to facilitate meetings with utility companies and the contractors so that they can better understand the nature of the risks that they're taking on. Because any utility diversion is inextricably linked with the contractor's programme, it's very important that that's well understood. And we want to ensure that any bids that we get in for these projects are robust and that everybody understands what the risk transfer mechanism is. On a related point, it was suggested that the number of utility diversions on this 58-kilometre project are exceptional at 300. I'll let you draw your own conclusions, but on an 11-kilometre section of the M8 contract, there were 170 utility diversions. You may well draw the conclusion then that 300 over 58 kilometres might not seem exceptional. Uh, but just to finally close up, there were some diversions here, I think related, or at least potential diversions related to things like gas pipelines that perhaps would not have applied to the M8. There's some complexities that are quite specific to this the, every, environment. Every project brings its own bespoke um, complexities, if you like. Um, but the, the nature of the diversions and the uh, utilities protections and, and, and the like here weren't any different to those that we would have had on other projects, other recent projects in Scotland that some of these contractors will have been involved in. So it's not, not unusual in that respect. But just to clarify that then, just before we on to move on to the next question, so I understand it, is that before the contract was awarded in 2014, Transport Scotland would have been in contact with those utilities which may have been affected by this project and would have warned them of potential timescales with the road opening in 2018. Is that correct? That's correct. And we will have made those communications clear to the contractor. And in the contract document, we will have given them the information that we've had from the utility companies at that point. So there would be every, every expectation by the contractor that, that some dialogue had been had with the utilities and they were aware of the project and prepared to move on with it within the timescales that the government had set. There'll be every expectation from the contractor that the utilities are aware of the project and there is every opportunity for the contractor to also meet with the utilities and discuss their own programmes with them. OK, that's interesting. Lewis. Thank you very much, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, uh, listened with great interest to what you had to say and you said, I think, it's now two months since the stretch of road from Stonehaven to Crabston was ready to use and that you still questioned uh, why it has taken the contractor so long to get to this point. I take it you heard the evidence they presented to us earlier this morning. Uh, their answer earlier this morning was, this is all terribly complicated and we have to ask permission from all sorts of other people. Do you find that as an acceptable explanation for um, the, the most modern stretch of road in the country lying unused for uh, a whole, an entire two months uh, because there's a failure of internal communication on the side of the contractor? In short, no. 
Um, uh, I am, uh, and I've expressed my frustration in the Chamber uh, on a couple of occasions when I've been questioned on this matter. Um, just to put this in a, some context, when I um, discussed the matter with uh, uh, Peter Truscott, who is the Chief Executive of uh, uh, Galliford Tri, on the 29th of October, uh, he informed me that the uh, contract variation, which had been worked on for several weeks, and it was between the lawyers of the different parties, um, was with the lenders. And as I pointed out in my statement to the Chamber, uh, with less than 24 hours having passed from that conversation, I get a letter telling me that's not the case. Uh, despite that apparently Peter Truscott, who is the chief executive of uh, Guildford, tried telling me that it was with the lenders. Uh, and then uh, it, we get into a situation where it appeared to be that uh, they weren't able to make progress with the matter of a contract variation with the lenders, which is why I then asked for a meeting uh, with, the, uh, with ARL, uh, which took place, uh, uh, which took place um, on the Thursday of that week, um, which was the 7th um, of uh, November, uh, uh, where uh, the chief executive of Balfour Beatty uh, and, uh, uh, and the other representatives for ARL attended that meeting um, uh, to try and identify what was the barrier in them being able to share this then with their, uh, with their lenders. They identified a few issues uh, which they believed that could be potential barriers with their lenders. Um, uh, I asked my officials to take those issues away to see if they could be addressed. Uh, a new contract variation was presented to them on the 12th of November, uh, which is a Monday uh, following that. So that's within two working days uh, for them. Uh, and it was then uh, with them and the lawyers to then agree to that contract variation. What I can tell you happened in that intervening period is that, um, uh, and I noticed that they were saying that the contract variation uh, agreement for the lenders was agreed on the, was on the 21st of November. They sought to try and renegotiate uh, the contract variation, uh, which I was not prepared to do, <coughs> because what had been put to them I thought was perfectly reasonable and addressed the concerns that they'd previously raised with me. That was the final offer, and that had been made clear to them. It was then for them to progress the matter with the lenders, which they then subsequently did, which has resulted in their announcement today that they intend to open the section. It can be opened uh, by the end of next week. And is it your view that that change of heart by the contractors after the 21st of November was simply a, 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 a recognition that there was not to be any financial benefit to them from uh, maintaining their position that they'd held up to that point? I suspect that the penny had dropped. Um, I wasn't prepared to get into a situation where they were seeking to try and use the negotiations to open phase 2B that can be opened with their wider claim. They had two entirely separate issues. And I wasn't prepared to have uh, be held to ransom uh, by companies on how they wanted to negotiate this process. My view is that they'd taken a misguided commercial approach to deal with the claim alongside that of phase 2B. And I wasn't prepared to accept that and to allow the taxpayer to be exposed to that type of risk. And I suspect they eventually realised that I wasn't prepared to move in that matter. The evidence the contractors gave this morning was that they recognised uh, that there was no link, or they, 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 they asserted there was no link between uh, uh, the, the agreement to open 2B and any commercial benefit that they may I heard that evidence. From that. And um, uh, from the discussions I had with ARL, including the chief executive of Balfour Beatty, I quickly came to the conclusion that they wanted both issues to be dealt with in parallel. And are you now confident, finally, that the legal signing of the contract variation will now occur in the next few days? Well, they've given us assurances. That will be the case. You heard the assurances they gave to the committee as well in that matter. Um, but, um, uh, and I hope that they will keep true to those uh, commitments. Um, uh, but uh, this could have been resolved at a much earlier stage. Uh, had they not taken what I believe was a, a misguided commercial approach to trying to deal with their claim and the issue of phase 2B. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and the next question is from Peter. Uh, no, uh, Rich Lyle, I was bringing you in briefly. Can I ask you, do you intend to look at any future contracts like this? My experience of the similar contract, M8, M73, M74, it was too tight. Was they able, able to be amended? 
Um, that was officials' words, not my words. Um, uh, in a set contract, not you, you weren't able to open sections of the road due to contractual problems. So, do you intend to, whenever we do another major contract like this, to ensure that you? When you say it, it was too tight. What do you mean by that? Well, it couldn't be. It couldn't be amended. For instance, and sorry, uh, convener, uh, I wanted extra fencing put on the M8, and that wasn't allowed. No, no, no Mr. Lyle. I, I would give an example, convener. I would Mr. Lyle, an Mr. Lyle. You asked for an example, you got it. Mr. Mr. Lyle, I, Mr. Lyle, Mr. Lyle, I'm sorry, I've not allowed that in the past, and I'm not going to allow it now. Could you, Cabinet Secretary, could you please answer the question is whether you will review the contract terms for, for future contracts uh, to try and make it more easy for parties to understand? And could you answer that specific question? We just need to be careful here about the... Um, I understand that contractors get into a contract if there are challenges that they then face will then say it's the contract's fault. Um, we also have a responsibility to protect the taxpayers' interest in these matters. And these companies enter into these contracts with a lot of technical and legal advice with their eyes wide open. So, any review uh, of contracts that take place, and like any major infrastructure project, you would always look back on how it's been carried out. So, for example, we saw from the at uh, the Queensferry Crossing uh, Audit Scotland report on that, how it was a very effective contract and it was managed uh, uh, as well. It, you always look back on major infrastructure projects. Are there lessons to be learned? But if the intention is that these types of contract should be made easier for contractors to simply lodge a claim against the government uh, and make it easier for them to get additional uh, payments from the government, the answer is no. And we can leave it there. Mr Lyles had his answer. Peter, um, could you go on with the next question, please? Yeah. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. In, in terms of your responsibility and the Scottish Government's responsibility, we've, we've discussed the, you know, the extra costs. I don't want you to go into that. But what other issues, what other outstanding issues are still to be resolved as regards this AWPR road to allow it to open? I mean, I, I'm, some of my, my thoughts are, 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 are around the... The Queen's Ferry Crossing, for instance, been open for some considerable time, but there are still snagging issues going on. So what issues are, are you, are you uh, thinking that are, that are still there to be resolved as far as the AWPR is concerned? Well, clearly the remedial work they have to carry out in the bridge over the River Don is the, the most outstanding of those. Um, it should be said, though, that in any major infrastructure project, there will always be snagging work. In any major building project. A building can be used, but there'll be snagging work for an extended period of time, and builders remain liable for uh, dealing with issues for an extended period of time, even in a, in a house building project, uh, never mind a major road building uh, project. So there will always be snagging work that can be carried out once the actual uh, project has been largely completed for the purposes for it to be used for what it was designed uh, for. Uh, and AWPR will be no different with that. However, the the way in which this contract is taken forward is that ARL are responsible for the maintenance of the road as well for the next 30 years. So uh, they'll be responsible for any snagging issues. I heard your point around uh, drainage matters. Um, uh, for some farmers, that's a matter that ARL should be taken forward if there are uh, issues of concern uh, that need to be addressed. And issues of maintenance in the future will fall to them as well, uh, given the nature of this contract. So the, uh, the most outstanding issue is clearly the technical issues over the, the bridge over the River Don. Well, I thank you for that answer, and it does, it does give, a, you know, there was alongside the, 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 the route of the road some confidence that con concerns that may not come to, to light for, for a considerable time, drainage being one of them, will be addressed. So I, I, I thank you for that. Mark, you wanted to cross question. Yes, one of the issues, I, I raised this with you, Cabinet Secretary, your statement was that if the section to Crabston opened uh, prior to the Don Crossing being finished, if traffic wants to connect further on north using the, the AWPR, they would need to divert off uh, through the Dice Industrial Estates and potentially the village itself. And you said that work was underway to ensure that traffic management, appropriate traffic management was in place to reduce disruption. Given that we've now got a, a date for the opening of that section and there will be a lag before the, the full route is complete, can you advise, is that work 
uh, completed and will it, when, when will that work be notified and will it be yourselves who notify or will it be the responsibility of the local authority so that businesses and residents can have some reassurance? Okay. Um, and I do recall the point that you raised during the course of my statement. I'll bring Michelle Rennie in she can give you a bit more technical detail around the uh, plans. What I was very clear about um, during the course of my involvement was to make sure that uh, should any contract variation be agreed to, that we are ready to move as quickly as possible. So Transport Scotland have advanced their plans to make sure that as soon as we have a date as to when that road can open, that we have the arrangements in place for that to take place. And that means the additional works that have to be put in place to manage traffic in the area that you made reference to, including with Police Scotland as well. Uh, so we get the uh, sign off and I'll ask Michelle maybe to give you a bit more detail around some of the technical plans. I'm delighted if you want to give an overview, if you want to write specifically to, to the member and the committee to ex explain what you're doing in detail, I'm happy to receive that at okay. a later date, Michelle. Okay, um, okay so I'll, I'll, I'm happy to do that, convener, um, but it's maybe just worth saying that, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned, we've been uh, undertaking some work for a period of time to understand what the impact of opening this section of road would be on the surrounding communities. Um, and we've done that work as a, as a collaborative piece of work between our own technical advisors, um, uh, the, both local authorities and the contractor. Um, so we understand what that is. The uh, traffic management associated with the, the, um, the uh, rerouting the traffic will be a, a, a collaborative piece of work between all of those organisations because everybody no understands best what the impact is on their own network um, and uh, all the, the signage and everything has been agreed. So there's a plan in place and it's just to be implemented now and hopefully it'll be for just a short period until such time as the, the dawn crossing is opened. I mean, obviously, the run-up to Christmas is a, is a busy time, and the Crabston route, uh, the Crabston Junction feeds to Aberdeen Airport. So, on top of that increased uh, flow to the airport around Christmas time, there will also be the traffic that is then connecting north. So, have you had conversations with Aberdeen Airport as well uh, to ensure that they can take whatever steps necessary to notify travellers and make appropriate arrangements for for people who are going to be going to the airport around Christmas time? We'll, we, we will put out whatever notifications are required um, and we'll do so in conjunction with Traffic Scotland and the local authorities. Um, but I'll write to you in, in detail. Uh, if you could write to the committee and, we, and we'll make sure it's passed on because I think that's relevant to all of us. I think um, that is all the questions on that and we're going to move on to the next question on the next subject which is from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Gail. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, we're going from one road to uh, two other roads now. The A9 duelling, which is 80 miles between Perth and Inverness, at a cost of £3 billion by 2025, and the A96, which is 86 miles between Aberdeen and Inverness, also at a cost of £3 billion by 2030. Could you give us an update on both of these projects, please? OK. Um, uh, it you're right in terms of the, the uh, drilling of the A9 is, a, is the biggest infrastructure project that's been undertaken in Scotland. It's a £3 billion uh, project, uh, which will drill between Perth and Inverness. Um, it's due to be completed uh, by 2025, and the uh, programme remains on target to achieve that. Um, uh, the first uh, part of the uh, of the uh, drilling has already taken place, which was the section which was from um, uh, Kincraig to Dalradi, uh, which opened in September uh, uh, of this year. And the construction contract for the second section uh, to be drilled is uh, the Lancarte uh, in Burnham, uh, which was awarded on the 21st of September to Balfour Beatty, uh, who will be undertaking that work. Uh, they are also uh, undertaking some preparatory work uh, around uh, constructing temporary access uh, roads, uh, access work areas um, uh, and ground uh, uh, works offices, uh, which will be their site offices, uh, which will be carried out uh, between now and early next year, alongside some of the design work which has been taken forward. Uh, the, uh, the A9 has been taken forward in 11 different uh, sections, um, uh, the orders for uh, 
the other nine sections, or sorry, the other eight of the other nine sections have been issued, which is about 95% of the draft orders have been issued. Um, the one which is outstanding is in the section which has been undertaken through a co-production model, uh, working with the local um, uh, community in the uh, Perthshire area. Um, uh, once that process is complete, the draft orders will be issued uh, for that section as uh, well. So the uh, the phasing of that work is, as I've mentioned, is going forward, and the draft orders, I say, for 95% of the dueling programme um, have now been issued, and then we'll have to wait to see whether we have. Um, uh, any uh, uh, public local uh, inquiries into those uh, orders. In relation to the A96, uh, we had the first PLI uh, for uh, the route there, which is a section from Inverness to Nairn, uh, which was completed last month. That's now with the reporter to finalise the representations which they have uh, received during the course of that public local uh, inquiry, and then we'll have to wait to see what the reporter's submission is to Scottish ministers in the matter. Uh, we've also completed uh, route options assessments work on the section between uh, Hardmuir and Fockabers, uh, with the preferred route options announced uh, just yesterday, with the public exhibition taking place between today and Friday of this week uh, for local residents and interested parties to come along and to, uh, uh, and to look at the detail of those. Uh, the route options um, assessment work is also underway on the 26 mile section, uh, which is east of Huntley and Aberdeen, uh, with initial options under consideration. Uh, and there's been a series of uh, exhibitions over the course of October to provide uh, feedback. And the committee may be interested to note that so far there have been 13,500 people uh, engaged in the process and giving feedback to the, uh, the proposed uh, programme along the A96. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. Just um, a, a question then on the um, inquiries. I know it's a long time scale, 2025 and 2030, but if we have a number of uh, PLIs, is that going to knock the timetable out at all? Um, it, it has a potential to, uh, depending on the length of time which they take and the length of time it then takes for the reporter to uh, uh, submit the report to ministers. Uh, you'll be aware that uh, it had an impact on the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route um, historically, which led to extensive legal challenges as well, uh, which caused a delay there. So there is, of course, always that potential. However, um, the scheduling of the work we have at the present moment, um, uh, should it keep to that timetable, will allow us to meet uh, the end point that we're anticipating. Um, uh, but there is a potential that it could be delayed if there are uh, extensive PLIs. And um, just finally, um, you, you did mention the AWPR. What comfort can you give the committee that that's not going to happen again with these two major infrastructure projects? It's a different type of contract which has been used here. It's a capital bill contract which has been put in place. So. Yeah. The, the Longer Tee Burnham contract is a, is a standard design and build contract that we've used successfully throughout the country. Okay, thank you. Uh, John, you had a question. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, panel. Um, I, I'd like to hear you mention the co-conduction model, um, Cabinet Secretary, and, and I know that the Deputy First Minister is indeed a very enthusiastic supporter of that approach, and there's an assessment ongoing. Are you able to explain why that, that facility is not going to be made available to... Um, individuals who have interest in applying that approach to decision making around the Harbour <laughs> East section of the A96. Indeed, so, a feeling that Transport Scotland officials are positively frustrating any prospect of that approach being adopted. <laughs> I, I would hope that's not the case. Um, the reality is that um, this is the first time this co production model has been used in this way. Um, so it's been a learning process uh, for Transport Scotland and also for the community who have been involved in the process. Uh, and we want to evaluate that and look at it as well. Uh, it should be said it's also a longer process. Um, it takes longer uh, uh, for decisions to be arrived at as well, which clearly can have an impact on timeline for taking forward certain projects. Um, uh, so we want to learn from that uh, experience and to then look at how that could potentially be utilised in the future. Um, but it has very much been a, a learning experience which we want to look at how we can build on in the future. You'll understand the frustration of some groups there that this assessment process, as I understand, is concluded shortly, um, yet decisions may already be taken on preferred options without the opportunity for the communities to have engaged in that process. And 
I understand you want to speed things up, and you'll understand some people may wish to slow things down so that we have informed decisions. Can I ask you another aspect? And this is a, a simple request I understand may have been used in relation to the Dunkeld area, and that is where drone footage was used um, to, to provide additional um, uh, system whereby people can look at a route. Now, I understand that drone footage is quite often used by engineers anyway. Um, is there any reason why that couldn't be applied, uh, for instance, in the forest area? Do you want to? In, in order to use uh, drone footage, we need to get the consent of all of the landowners involved. That's, that's a requirement. Um, and we'll certainly look to do that in the future. Um, to date, we've used some aerial footage, and that's quite helpful in presenting these visualisations. Can you say where, where that's been used, if, if I may, in relation to... Because the, the, there is a, a view, as I say, that the, the Deputy First Minister is very enthusiastic about the process that was used in relation to the, the bit in the Deputy First Minister's constituency. I mean, we would obviously want the same high level of consultation and engagement used elsewhere. And, and, and as I say, we're, we're happy to do that and we're happy to look at that in the future. Is it possible that that could happen on the 96? Y yeah, we will look at that. What's the time frame for that, please? Well, uh, that's uh, 2030. No, no, no. Um, forgive me if I may. I'm trying to understand the time frame under which you would consider the co-creative process or co-productive process and also the use of drone footage to inform um, decision making. I mean, clearly everyone wants the, the most informed decision making, not one that might be seen as being drawn up in an office in the central belt. <coughs> In terms of time frame, um, I can't give you a time frame. I'd be more than happy to take that away and look at it with the with the A96 uh, project team to see, um, uh, given the schedule of uh, uh, it, the the schedule of works that they are taking forward in the, the consultation process, where it would fit into that process, uh, as and when it would be used. I'm grateful. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary. Just just before we move on on that. Sorry, just a, a question from me. You would have heard in the last evidence session I asked about subcontractors and the payment of subcontractors in joint ventures. There's evidence that some subcontractors relating to the A9 project haven't been paid because the joint venture is squeezing them. Do you think that that's acceptable if the Scottish Government have paid the, the, the joint ventures in full? I'm not aware of that, um, uh, and I would be concerned if that was the case as well. Uh, as you'll be aware, from the Scottish Government's point of view, Transport Scotland have a contract with the main contractor, who are then responsible for paying subcontractors, and we would expect that to be carried out in an appropriate fashion. Um, uh, if, there was, uh, if there was evidence that that, um, uh, that was an issue that was uh, arising for contractors, then I'd be more than happy for us to, to look into that issue to see if it can be addressed. But in principle, you wouldn't find that acceptable? No, I wouldn't find that acceptable if payment was being withheld. Thank, thank you very much. The next question, therefore, is uh, from Richard Love. Richard. Uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary, can we look at the ongoing work at the Queen's Ferry Crossing? Transport Scotland officials wrote to committee on 8th January 2018, setting out details of minor work still to be completed at Queen's Ferry Crossing, Stating expected the work to be completed by September 2018. But <clears throat> now, due to principally painting the underside of the bridge deck, which I find uh, should be no, I painted it before we opened it, um, will not be completed until the end of 2019. So, can, I exp can you explain to me why the deadline for completion of works to the Queensferry Crossing was extended from September? 2018 until the end of 2019, that's a year, I think. Um, don't you do you anticipate any further delays? Are there any still work still to be done? Will the work be all be done by the end of 2018? And can we finally um, be confident that we will, we will reach and match what we say? Well, look, um, uh, the underdeck painting doesn't have to be completed to open the road for users to make use of the road. So. Um, that's why it's been covered as part of the snagging work um, that's completed after the project has been uh, opened for uh, road use. Uh, the reason uh, there have been some challenges with this is that the contractor who's responsible for carrying out that work um, has to have a, a deck area that they can utilise for uh, getting underneath the bridge. They've had technical issues uh, with the contractor, the subcontractor that they were working with to deliver that. Uh, which has presented some challenges with, uh, for them, uh, which has resulted in a delay in being able to actually get that in place. Um, 
it's also work that then when they do start it, that's weather sensitive um, as well. So there are periods during the winter when it wouldn't be appropriate during certain temperatures to actually carry out that type of uh, painting work. So the problem in getting this lower deck area that they require for uh, the platform for working on, uh, the delay in being able to get that has had an impact on uh, being able to carry out the work then associated with some of the weather conditions that they're limited in how they can carry out that work. However, they expected that completed by the end of next year. The second area is in relation to some of the uh, concrete finishing that needs to take place on uh, the pillars. Uh, there have been some issues for the contractors around the safe working arrangements for carrying out that work, uh, which has been progressed. Um, and uh, uh, once that's been resolved, then they should be in a position to be able to complete that next year as well. Again, it's a type of work which is weather sensitive. And given the nature of the environment they're working in as well, um, uh, it's more restricted than it would normally be for other circumstances, as you can appreciate, um, with winds, etc., uh, that they might be exposed to. So a combination of uh, some technical issues and also some weather-related issues have an impact on completing that work. I think it's an e I actually think it's an excellent bridge. I'm quite uh, pleased to go over it. Um, but, you know, I find it amazing that, uh, you know, the, the underside wasn't painted before it was opened, you know, because they were still working. And if you're doing the underside, you're, you're, you could, you're not affecting the work on the, on the top. But anyway, I'll take that aside. Will there there'll be ongoing maintenance? There will be, on, so we know, there will be still ongoing maintenance, like anything, uh, uh, of this bridge all over its period of uh, the next hopefully 100 years. I think it's quite like the rail bridge that by the finished painting at one end, they have to start at the other end. No, so, I, I think they uh, stopped that for a while. But there is a... stop doing that for a while. There is a... There is a do that now. <laughs> there is a team. Uh, so there is a... Uh, I think there's about 200 contractors actually um, working on the bridge still to deal with some of the snagging work. Uh, there's also a dedicated Transport Scotland team uh, who work alongside them and there's a project team uh, that meet with them to look at the progress of making around some of the snagging work as well. 2019, basically everything that was previously outstanding from when it was constructed will be finished. Should be, yes. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, I think it might help the committee just to, to keep us informed, to have a list of, as you've done in the past, or Transport Scotland's done in the past, of all outstanding works, because we've heard various stories about lifts malfunctioning, um, you've said about the painting and uh, various things, so it'd be very useful to have a list and, and when those works will be completed, uh, and perhaps explaining the, the constructions around all the... Um, uh, hawsers that came down into the bridge... Uh, which are, I think now being removed. But I think an, an updated list for the committee would be extremely helpful. Yeah, more than happy to look at doing that. I'm not entirely sure whether there's anything in addition to the last update you received. Um, but what I'd be happy to do is if there's any uh, additional things to bring those to your attention. Perhaps if you could give us a full list, then we can check it against the original list. And with that question, we'll move on to Colin, if I may, please. Thanks, convener, and, and good morning to the, the panel. Can I um, um, turn our attention to issues on our railways? Um, in September, ScotRail's performance fell below the, the breach level set out in the, uh, the franchise agreement. Cabinet Secretary, why did you not take enforcement action against Abelio for their, their failure to meet the contractual obligations and instead granted a waiver against enforcement of those obligations? Well, as I've um, previously stated in Parliament, or uh, as others have also previously stated in Parliament, the reason for um, providing a waiver was because there were a number of factors that had an impact on uh, ScotRail's performance, which were out with their control. So there were weather-related incidents. There was Storm Alley, which had a, a significant impact. There was also um, uh, infrastructure problems, uh, which uh, had an impact uh, on their uh, performance. There was also uh, delays in rolling stock being provided to them by Hitachi as well. Factors which were out with their control directly in being able to uh, deal with these issues. And the franchise is designed in such a way as that uh, that can be taken account of. Uh, and uh, it seemed reasonable uh, that given the uh, undertaking the Donovan review uh, to look at how they could uh, take forward further improvements uh, and that they were making progress with the recommendations set out within the Donovan review, uh, alongside the factors which were out with their control that had an impact on their performance, that there was a, a reasonable case to consider a, a variation or to, to consider a waiver um, of the... Uh, of the performance at breach level. Having said that, there is a threshold 
uh, that it doesn't drop below 1% um, of uh, that performance uh, level. Uh, should it uh, further decrease, uh, then there will have to be a remedial plan uh, put in place in order to address that. So it was a combination of factors, uh, uh, recognising that they were out with the control of ScotRail that were having a, an impact on their performance, and it seemed reasonable to me that they should have a waiver to allow them to actually make progress on the programmes of work that they're taking forward to try and address these issues through the recommendations set out in the Donovan Review. Okay, but, but in an email um, on the 19th of September from your private secretary to Transport Scotland's Scott Rail Franch manager, uh, in response to this request by Scott Rail for, for a waiver, um, the private secretary stated, and I quote, Mr Matheson is now content but wants to be very clear with Scott Rail that any further drop in performance will be unacceptable. So that was in September, but since September, in the two reporting periods, performance has actually got worse. Um, so do you think it was a mistake for you to, to grant the waiver without a single explicit condition around improving performance? No, because there is a condition. If they drop 1% below that base level, uh, then they will have to fall into producing a remedial plan to take that forward. So, so in the last... And all of the other... It's worth making the point. All of the other conditions within the, uh, within the, uh, within the franchise continue to be applied. Yes, but this email was very clear. You said there should not be any further drop in performance. You said it would be unacceptable, but there has been um, a further drop. But you did touch on where we are at the moment. And you're right, in the last reporting uh, period, Scott Rail are just basically 0.03% away from falling more than the 1% below breach level, which you mentioned. That's obviously pro prohibited by the, the waiver. Now, given that Scott Rail haven't hit a franchise public performance measure since 2015. When do you think they'll actually rise above that breach level? And specifically, do you actually think this franchise is ever going to hit the 92.5% overall franchise target that's been set? Well, look, I'm, uh, I'm aware there's an extensive amount of work being taken forward to try and achieve that. Um, uh, including the uh, new rolling stock, the infrastructure investments which are being made, uh, 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 the change in personnel um, around certain provisions within, uh, certain arrangements within uh, ScotRail to try and address some of these matters. Uh, so I'm satisfied there's a, a significant amount of work being taken forward to try and address the, those issues to help to achieve the franchise uh, target. But I also recognise that there are issues which are completely out with ScotRail's control that have a direct impact on their performance. So as I mentioned in the Chamber yesterday, in the last quarter, 59.5% uh, of all delays were caused by network rail. Uh, and by and large, over the course of last year, it has been in excess of 50% of all of the delays have been caused by network rail. These are matters which are out with the control of Scott Rail in being able to address these issues readily. That's why there's a need for Network Rail uh, to have much more robust uh, project management in place and also to be much more customer focused on how they take forward their infrastructure improvement programme to minimise the disruption it causes to those who are providing rail services and ultimately services to the travelling public. And the present arrangements, in my view, uh, as to how Network Rail is managed and how it's operated, um, isn't adequate to be able to address that. And something much more fundamental needs to take place in changing that arrangement if we are to start to address these issues more effectively. Just to clarify, just to when you're saying network rail delays, that includes weather, uh, or a lot of things that network rail can't affect, like weather, um, adverse uh, things like regrettable just things like suicides on tracks that close things and delays from trains. There are quite a lot of things in there which network rail cannot actually affect. It, it, am I right in saying that? Yes, you are. Um, uh, the concern is that they are increasing um, as what, well. The, those adverse effects that they can't... They no, can't. The, 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 the impact that network rail are having on rail performance... Yeah. Uh, is increasing uh, proportionately. Hence why uh, the Office of the Rail Regulator uh, last week announced that they are taking enforcement action against uh, Network Rail because of their poor performance and the impact, as they state, the impact that's actually having on performance levels and the impact it then has on the travelling public. 
and the committee have had a very useful briefing from them last week. Sorry, Colin Smith. Uh, Colin, to interrupt you. Uh, no, th th these arrangements were clearly obviously known when the franchise was awarded to, to, to ScotRail, or sorry, to Abelio, ScotRail franchise. So can I come back to the question, though? Do you actually think that we will ever get to a stage where this current franchise will meet the 92.5% overall franchise target? Do you think that will be met? And if so, when do you think that will be met? I think it will be challenging uh, to meet it. Uh, but what I'm confident of is that there is a course of action being taken to give us every opportunity to make sure that that target is achieved. What I can't provide you with is a date as to when it will be achieved for the very reasons that I've just outlined, is that there are a range of factors that are out with the control of the franchise holder that can have a direct impact on that target being achieved, most notably network rail and the deterioration in their performance. Jamie, and come back to you, if I may, if there's a further question you want to ask, Jamie. Th thank you, Convener. I, uh, just to continue this line of questioning, I think it's an important point. Uh, I know there's a lot of politics at play uh, when we talk about Scotland's rail, but the reality is that this number of the percentage of delays which is attributed to network rail is often used as a top line figure. But the reality is, as by your own admission, is that uh, a substantial amount of that are elements which are outside of network rail's control, including the weather. Uh, I'm sure the cabinet secretary would appreciate that's something that's beyond the control of, of, of any uh, government agency or public body. But can I ask uh, specifically, uh, you mentioned in the chamber yesterday that you were having a meeting with ScotRail to discuss this issue. I think the Cabinet Secretary himself accepts that performance is not where it should be. Um, are those meetings minuted, uh, or would you be willing to share uh, perhaps what was said during that meeting? Yeah, there would be a note of the meeting. Okay, and what was said? Uh, the meeting yesterday. Uh, the meeting yesterday was about the unacceptable levels of cancellations that had been taking place um, over the course of the weekend and into the beginning of this week. Um, uh, uh, Scott Rail explained the reason as to why that had been the case, combination of factors, uh, the late arrival by Hitachi of the new 385s. So Hitachi have let down Scott Rail in delivering them in the time schedule which they had planned to, which has meant that the training programme for training the crews on the new, uh, uh, the new trains is behind schedule. Uh, they've been trying to exhilarate the process of uh, getting more of the trains um, accepted into the ScotRail network, which has meant that ScotRail have also had to exhilarate their training programme. And with the timetable change taking place on the 9th of December, this Sunday, they had to get as much of that completed as they could uh, with the new uh, train timetable and with the new rolling stock that will become available over the course of uh, the timetable change. And alongside that, the industrial action which has been taken around the uh, rest days working arrangements, which has had a, a direct impact on the number of staff and crew who are available to undertake the training and also to maintain the existing uh, rail network. Um, what ScotRail were able to uh, confirm to me that they, uh, are, uh, uh, they were having discussions yesterday with the trade unions with a view to trying to resolve again uh, this dispute. I've encouraged them to do everything they can to resolve the dispute as soon as possible, uh, and I hope that they will achieve that um, uh, in the not too distant uh, future. Uh, but I've also uh, made it clear to them is that the, uh, the communication of uh, uh, the significant impact that these cancellations were having on the public, it was not to the standard that I would expect. Um, I understand there has been a convergence of challenging issues that they've had to try and manage and deal with as best they can. Um, however, uh, uh, the travelling public deserve better uh, and uh, they should have communicated that much more clearly at a much earlier stage uh, to allow the public to understand the potential impact it could have had on the services that they were looking to use. Uh, you've just said, sorry, I know, I know there are other questions to come up, but you've just said the public deserve better. They do indeed. Um, but you've also just said that you think it will actually be quite challenging that ScotRail will ever meet the targets that are set for them uh, within this current contract. It doesn't sound overly positive. Well, I think the changes which will be made as a result of the new rolling stock, the additional electrification that's taken place, the Seven Cities programme uh, for the high-speed trains will make a massive difference. And when the full timetable change is implemented by December 2019, um, capacity on our rail network and the fleet on our uh, rail network will have uh, increased and the uh, uh, number of services will have increased as well. 
Uh, uh, so there'll be absolutely no doubt there'll be significant improvements. When I say it, it's going to be challenging to meet that, uh, that target within the franchise. It will be challenging because there are a range of factors which are out with uh, Scott Rail's control uh, that can have an impact on achieving that, uh, that level uh, of performance. Uh, and my view is that the existing structural arrangements uh, compromise uh, the ability to deliver better passenger services because of the uh, challenges that you have between the infrastructure uh, uh, delivery, uh, uh, the infra infrastructure delivery body, and that of the rolling stock service provider. Just on rolling stock, I'm going to actually because it formed part of another question. I'm going to bring Peter in on that, and, and then come back to you, Colin, if I may. Peter. Yeah, um, you've. Cabinet Secretary, you've, you've already mentioned the, the significant delays to the introduction of new rolling stock, including the Class 385s, which you've already mentioned, and the refurbished high-speed trains for the Aberdeen-Edinburgh uh, route. Uh, you, you, on that route, only one of ten uh, trains have actually been refurbished. So my question is, is Transport Scotland taking enforcement action against any of the organisations involved in these projects for failure to deliver on time? So, um, in terms of rolling stock, uh, three areas uh, where there are delays. Hitachi 385s, um, reason for the delay, Hitachi. Um, uh, delays in the, what you call it, the New Caledonian sleeper. Reasons for the delay, CAF, the company who are manufacturing the new trains. Uh, uh, and also, the reason for the delay in the refurbishment of uh, the high-speed trains is Wabtec, the private sector company who are responsible for carrying out uh, the, uh, the refurbishment works as well. Um, as much pressure as possible has been applied to these organisations to try and make progress. I'm due to have a, a, a call with the, the global head. Um, I've had a call with the global head of Atachi to make it very clear in Japan about uh, it's unacceptable uh, that we are facing these delays, that it's having a marked impact on uh, performance here in Scotland. Um, I've also uh, made it very clear to Sa uh, 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 CERCO, who have got the Caledonia Sleeper programme, um, about it being unacceptable that new rolling stock has been delayed for the, uh, for the sleeper. Uh, and next week, I'm having a call with the, uh, with the global head uh, in the States uh, of, uh, of Wabtec uh, to make it clear that the, their failure to deliver the refurbishment programme and the timeline that they agreed to when they went into the contract, again, is unacceptable. Uh, it's having a direct impact um, on the quality of passenger services that can be uh, delivered. So, uh, as much as can be done uh, to try and apply pressure to these companies who are responsible for carrying out this work is being applied. But I accept that then has a direct impact. Uh, their lack of keeping to the timelines that they agreed to when they went into the contracts is having a direct impact on passenger services and the quality of passenger services that we expect passengers to receive. That's fine, but does that mean that there'll be financial consequences to, to, for these companies and, and, and some sort of compensation come back to, to, you, to the Scott Rail or whoever sure. uh, as a result of that? So in, in terms of um, uh, the, the issue around um, uh, the performance when it comes to Scott Rail, which would be the Hitachis and the high-speed trains, uh, there are penalty provisions within the franchise arrangement if they are not able to deliver um, on the commitments kept set out within the franchise arrangement. Some of that money, as you'll be aware, has already been used and recircled into the rail infrastructure and rail services to try and improve those as well. Uh, so we're, we've already done that. Uh, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the contract with the circle for the sleeper service as well, uh, there are penalty provisions within that for their failure to be able to deliver on the commitment set out within it. Uh, to provide the new rolling stock in time uh, as well. Okay. OK. Thank you. Stuart, very briefly, and then I'm, then I'm coming to you, Colin. Um, the 365s that have been hired in to cover the gap, who's paying for them? Uh, part of the money for that is actually coming from the penalties which have been applied to the franchisee. OK. Thank you. Good Colin. Can you explain why um, Transport Scotland decided to make early contractual payments to Obelio? So part of the uh, reason for that was because of, and I'll ask Bill Reeves to say a bit more in detail around it, was because of the, uh, the financial challenges which uh, Abelio, uh, uh, Scott Rail Abelio were facing within <laughs> the franchise as a result of a lack of uh, growth uh, in their 
uh, in their patronage level, which was having a direct impact on uh, their financial standing. That had largely come about as a result of um, a couple of uh, significant issues. So, for example, the closure of the, uh, the Queen Street Tunnel uh, had a direct impact. The delay in completing the uh, Edinburgh to uh, Glasgow uh, improvement programme, again, had an impact on their ability to grow uh, their service, uh, and that had financial implications uh, for them. Uh, so the uh, re-basing uh, re of it, the reprogramming of the being able to draw down money earlier was in recognition of that. Having said that, there is no additional cost to the taxpayer. Uh, this is simply drawing money forward at an earlier stage to meet some of the challenges which they face financially as a result of that lack of uh, growth within, uh, within their own uh, intended projections when they went into the franchise, uh, but it has got no additional cost to the taxpayer. But Bill can maybe say a wee bit more about some of the technical aspects about it. I, I've not got much to add to, to what you said, Cabinet Secretary, but I, uh, I think it's just to say that this is using the provisions within the contract. At the time the contract is signed, there is a forecast revenue line that's included within the contract. Uh, it is the case that that revenue growth was held back uh, by the uh, delays to the electrification of the Edinburgh-Glasgow route and by the um, impact on the Queen Street tunnel closure, which wasn't known to the franchisee at the time of entering into the contract. Uh, and uh, we considered it appropriate to use the revenue support mechanism in the light of that change. Um, but it is no increase in the total amount of money that's being, uh, being uh, paid by the Scottish Government to ScotRail. So, so, so Abelio won't be um, out of pocket because of the current delays, but do you think it's fair that, that passengers are going to be out of pocket by facing yet another fare hike in January at a time that, that performance is way below, I think everybody here believes is acceptable? Just Let me just be clear here in the point, uh, going back to your last question, there is no additional cost to the taxpayer for drawing forward those early payments. Uh, so there's no linkage to this idea of fare increases in January, uh, which is a time when fare increases in the net rail network across the whole of the UK takes place. It's not linked to this idea of drawing down uh, uh, some of the uh, early payments uh, from next year into this year. I think we're very clear that, that we, we are saying that the payments are being paid in advance because of delays. So effectively, compensation, if you like, is being given to Abelia with advance payments because of delays, but nothing is being given to the passengers, the ones that you said, in fact, your phrase was passengers deserve better. So if passengers deserve better, why are we going ahead with those fare increases in January? Well, but let, I just want to emphasise this point, is that there is no additional cost to the taxpayer from drawing forward these early payments. They're drawing them forward into this year that they would have been tied to them in the next financial year, but when it comes to next financial year, they'll not be there uh, because they've drawn forward into this financial year. So there's no additional costs. And also, as I want to emphasise, the fare increase is not related to this in any way. Uh, the fare increase is the uh, RPI increase that takes place um, every year across the whole of the UK network. However, in Scotland, in recognition of that, uh, we also cap that. So, for example, uh, for, those which are, uh, for those which are regulated off-peak fares, it is 1% below RPI, uh, and the, the, those peak fares, it is RPI. Um, that's the lowest increase for any part of the UK. And it's actually one of the lowest fare increases since, I think, since 2005 or 2007, um, over an extended period of time. Uh, possibly since we actually started to have responsibility for uh, franchising uh, the rail network in Scotland. Uh, but I also recognise that any increase in fares is uh, something which is unfortunate. Uh, but it is also worth keeping in mind that two-thirds of the cost of rail in Scotland is met by the Scottish Government. When you compare that to in England and Wales, uh, that's significantly more, where it's only 50% in England uh, and Wales. So we recognise it's, it's, it's unfortunate, uh, but we do our best to try and cap that. Uh, but, also recognises, but we also need to recognise the very significant investment the Scottish Government puts into rail by meaning two costs, two thirds of the costs of uh, rail within Scotland on an annual basis. But, but you don't accept that, that given how poor performance is, given the fact that performance is plummeting, you should not be reconsidering that fare increase? 
Well, what I've said to you is about performance is it's not where it should be, but I also recognise that there's a course of action being taken to try and address these matters. Um, as I've mentioned, from the Donovan review through to the investments in your own stock, which has taken place, and the additional infrastructure enhancements, which have been carried out as well, all of which are about improving uh, performance in moving forward. And um, I'm very clear about the need to make sure that they deliver on an improved performance, particularly as we move into the new timetable change that takes place this weekend and which will be completed in a year's time um, over the course of the next year. Thank you. I, I'm afraid we're going to have to move on, Colin. Uh, John, yours is the next question. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, as you're aware, the Scottish Green Party support the devolution of network rail, but it's not some magic get-out-of-jail card when it comes to accountability, and I know you're not necessarily presenting it as such, because, of course, what we're going to see is we're going to see increasing episodes of extreme weather, which is going to contribute. So we'll maybe come to that later. Can I ask you, as a general principle, do you believe any organisation that requires the to rely on the goodwill of its staff to work on their days off has sufficient staff? Um, I think the reality would be, no, they don't, if they are too dependent on it, which is why I welcome the fact that ScotRail are uh, in the process of employing, I believe, in the region of around 140 extra staff, which will allow them to remove the need for rest day working. It's... It's quite. I mean, we, we had um, Mr. Hines and his, his team in here. There's Transport Scotland. There's yourself. It, it's, it's quite cluttered. This system, isn't it, um, of accountability? Uh, between, uh, as in between, like the infrastructure, rolling stock, franchisees, etc. No, as between the franchisee, Transport Scotland, and the political accountability. Um, yes, it is in some ways. Yes. I wonder. Um, do you have any plans to end the current ScotRail franchise when the first expiry date of 31st March 22 um, comes around, given the current performance? And no, not at present time. Focus is on its improving performance, uh, particularly as we move into the timetable change which is taking place this weekend and with the additional rolling stock, uh, which will come into place between, uh, uh, between now and May of next year uh, uh, in, in improving how the franchise is working at the present time. I wonder, Cabinet Secretary, what you think the uh, franchisee's attitude would have been if you'd said, well, obviously we're giving consideration to that. Is it something you are giving consideration to? Because, you know, with the worst performance figures in a long time, a long time, um, and I'll not repeat them, because actually at the end of the day, customers aren't interested in percentage rates. They just want to know that the, 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 the train turns up. And increasingly the train isn't turning up, or it's turning up late, or it's arriving late. Well, let's take the scenario that we choose to end... Uh, the contract early. We then get into a situation where we then have to put it back out for an R franchisee to take over the contract because we're legally obliged to do that. Uh, the challenges which the existing company that has the contract has will still be there. So if 60% of the delays uh, to the services have been caused by Network Rail, they'll still be there uh, for the next party who comes in to take it over to deal with as well. They won't magic away by simply ending the contract. Uh, uh, my view is that the existing structural arrangements in Rio um, it don't meet the needs of passengers adequately. Uh, and that's because of the way in which it is presently structured, both the infrastructure and the franchise uh, arrangements. So um, uh, the focus has got to be on how do we make the existing arrangements work to the best interests of the travelling public. And that's about making sure that we are delivering the improvements that can make the changes that will help to improve passenger experience from rolling stock right through to major projects such as electrification programmes as well, which Network Rail need to get much better at uh, taking forward in terms of project management in particular. So um, uh, uh, there are no plans to end the, the franchise on the basis that some of the challenges that the existing franchise uh, uh, holders are facing will still be there no matter who has the franchise. You're entirely right to say that, but of course this gets down to very raw politics and I don't want to intrude on in another question that I know is coming up, but it's comments like you've made that give the impression that, if you like, the Scottish Government have gone soft in the notion of having it public rail and exclusively in the interests of the Scottish public. No, we haven't, um, and it's wrong to try and characterise it that way as well and to suggest... Uh, well, if it's a perception, it's a misheld perception. 
uh, as far as I am concerned. What I'm also conscious of is taking that place. Option, Cameron, you've just ruled out that said you're not going to consider that option of ending yeah, the franchise. Because the structural arrangements which we would have in Rio would still be there if we end the existing franchise. We would have to put it back out for another franchise. So and then we would have the same of, problems. Regardless of performance. Pardon? Regardless of performance. Regardless of performance. You, you won't consider ending the franchise? Just for the sake of ending the franchise. No, for the sake of making efforts to improve the performance. You, well, we, 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 we hold the individuals in charge of that organisation accountable. I'm, they in turn are accountable to you and Cabinet Secretary. You're I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not going to end a franchise purely on the basis of uh, that uh, that, uh, that will be the answer to the challenges that we have around performance. Uh, because so many of the challenges to the existing franchise are coming about as a result of areas which they don't have control over. What I do think there's an opportunity is with the review of rail, which has been carried out by Kenneth Williams, in looking at the existing structural arrangements for how rail is provided across the whole of the UK, to get a model that would deliver much more passenger-focused approach to how we deliver rail services in Scotland, which is accountable to this parliament. And that's what I'm going to pursue, which then allows us to be in a position where we can address these performance issues more effectively for the travelling public in Scotland and to use a model that can better deliver that for the public as well. I think a model may be suggested to you in future questions. Thanks. <laughs> um, and, and the next question then is, is Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, Mr Finney's touched on it already. Uh, with regards to this um, public uh, sector bid uh, the Scottish Government wants to pursue, can you answer the following two questions for me? Uh, how much uh, does the government estimate the bid will cost itself and in terms of its modelling, if it's successful in that bid, how much would it cost to run the franchise in terms of the cost to the taxpayer? Well, the, do you mean if it was a, pr a public sector company? Indeed. And your, your, latter que your, yeah. your second question. So uh, what I'm saying is that the Scottish Government wants to put a public sector bid into that franchise uh, tender. Uh, what is the cost of the bid? And if successful, what would the cost be of running the service? We've secured the right for a public sector organisation to be able to bid for any franchise, which we're required to put out to franchise under the existing legislation as it stands at the present moment, which is out with their gift. It's controlled by the UK government uh, and by uh, 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 the Transport uh, Department of Transport, uh, the UK government. Uh, a bid on average for a, you call, for a franchise, I understand, is in the region of around £10 million for putting forward a bid. Uh, uh, what we then have to do is, if there was any uh, public sector body in Scotland looking to lodge uh, such a bid, or bodies, it could be more than one, that choose to make such a, a bid, is that they would need to be provided with financial resources to support them in being able to make such a franchise bid. The first question. So the cost uh, to the taxpayer of a, a bid, regardless of whether you win it or not, will be £10 million, correct? That seems to be the average okay. industry cost for uh, putting together a bid for okay. a franchise. The, mo the more important question really is, is if that bid was successful, uh, what estimates have the government undertaking as to the cost to the taxpayer of actually running a publicly owned service? Because that's the real question here. Um, the, 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 cost that would, the cost would actually be the cost of the actual franchise that they're taking on, uh, the overall cost of that. Um, you must which is, and I can give, I can give yeah, uh, sure. Bill, okay. can you, a specific so, figure. So we pay in the last year £394 million to ScotRail, of which 260 then goes on to Network Rail in track access charges. So the net cost is about £134 million, if I've done my maths right. Yes, £134 million. So, so, some of that, some, so the, the big number, yeah. is a lot of pass through to Network Rail for the infrastructure costs. Uh, so the net subsidy currently is in the £134 million. So 394 million is what is given to ScotRail yes, per sir. annum. 260 of which then gets paid by them to Network Rail. I understand, but is that the cost of running the service? That's diff the subsidy given that's to the, the operator is different the, from how much it costs to run the service. Indeed. So the other source of, uh, of funding for ScotRail is the fare box from the passenger. Okay, and, and but in the current system, Abellio are the uh, operator of the service, so therefore there is a, a risk associated with their involvement and any cost liabilities from their part. If they were removed from the equation and instead of a bellio, that party becomes the public, a, a government body, a public body, 
I guess what I'm asking is what would that risk potentially be? Because tell me what the subsidy is is not the same as tell me how much it's going to cost. Sorry? It, of course, so whoever, whoever holds a franchise takes on the liabilities that mm. goes with that and the risks that go with that. Um, uh, you're asking for a figure about what those risks would actually be. I don't know if we can give you a figure because uh, they could be for a whole variety of different things um, at different times. So, for example, if it was about delays in terms of uh, performance that would then have an impact on any any payments that the penalties that they had to pay uh, as well so it could be a, a whole variety of different things but the risk is carried by those who hold the franchise indeed but you don't know that you don't know what that risk might be so you, you, you in, in effect you're putting a, a you're spending 10 million pounds to put a bid in for something you've got no idea how much it's going to cost the public no, no. The, the, the ten, ten, my understanding is that the ten million pounds figure is around the cost to actually submit a bid, to put a bid together. You wouldn't necessarily be successful. It could cost you ten million pounds and not be successful. Uh, be so, yeah. But you, so you would be, you would. So there's a cost associated with the franchising process, which is inherent in the existing legislative process uh, within the rail network in the whole of the UK. Uh, um, However, I can't give you a figure in terms of uh, how some of those risks would crystallise on the basis of, is it due to penalty payments, about poor performance, etc., because it depends on a whole range of different factors, but the risk is carried by those who actually have the franchise. Okay, well, uh, and the franchise is obviously going to be won by those who actually put forward the best bid, sure. and, it's in the, and it's in the it's in taxpayers' interest. Okay. Uh, £10 million pounds seems like a, a lot of money to, 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 to lose if, if you're not successful, especially if it's public money, I should add. Um, can I move on then in a scenario? It is to get rid of franchising. Yeah, you're in. I mean, just before you move on, yeah. uh, can I just bring in John and then come back to you because he's got a supplementary, I think, on that particular point. Smiling in his face, I haven't heard the Cabinet Secretary just say that because, of course, that's the nub of the issue. The nub of the issue is franchising. And Mr Green, of course, would do well to... I mean, I know he wants to use the word risks, um, but, of course, the tremendous benefit that was accrued to the uh, UK Treasury... Um, by the failure twice in private franchise of the East Coast, generating £800 million profit. Um, I wonder if that's a model that the Scottish Government are looking at. And, of course, once again, it's, it's back in public ownership. It, interestingly, I had a, chair, a meeting with the chair of um, uh, LNER just yesterday uh, to discuss how, they were, uh, how their performance was. And um, it would be fair to say he's not pleased with their performance uh, at all, uh, given where they're at. I think their PPMs are down in the 72% uh, just now, uh, which, is very, which is very poor. A big part of which is because of challenges around rolling stock providers and infrastructure. So the point, the point I'm making about, maybe it's about getting rid of franchises, the problem uh, that I have around this idea of just saying, just saying this franchise and doing our franchise is that a lot of the inherent problems are still ingrained in the system and until that's addressed and it's more public and travelling public focused I don't think we will overcome some of these particular challenges sufficiently. I'm incredibly conscious now of time and, and the need for short questions and short answers. I'm going to bring Jamie in briefly and then the next question will be John. Thanks. Okay, thanks. And just to clarify, based on the supplementary that was asked, uh, is it the Scottish Government's official position that you would abolish franchising on the rail, on Scottish rail network? Is that correct? Um, I'm presently considering, as a result of the UK Rail Review, uh, which has been carried out, um, what I think would be a more optimal model uh, for delivering rail services in Scotland. Uh, and that could include uh, not having a system that requires franchising. Jamie, I'm, I'm sorry, Jamie. I, I, I said one question. Jamie, I'm, I'm sorry. I am going to have to move on. There are. A, 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 I apologise, but I have to try and keep things moving along. John, a question from you. Uh, thank you, convener. Well, to move to a completely different subject, uh, we have plans for two ferries that are being built. Uh, I understand at Ferguson's. Uh, some of the committee have uh, been to visit Ferguson's, and we also had evidence from CMAL. So there appear to be delays and there are alleged cost overruns. Um, can you say anything about uh, what you can do about this, what your view of the situation is at the moment? Uh, are there any potential penalties for either CMAL or Ferguson Marine? Where are we with it? OK, um, uh, so obviously there is a the delay. At the present moment, um, uh, Ferguson's are still indicating they expect to deliver uh, the 
the MV uh, Glen Sanox, uh, summer 2019, with the second vessel, which I think is 802, uh, to be by spring 2020. Um, as it stands just now, um, you may be aware from the evidence that you heard is that CMAL are heavily engaged with uh, Ferguson's around the uh, delay in the contract uh, and the, uh, so the completion of this, uh, these ferries. Um, they have uh, staff working with Ferguson's uh, to try and address some of these issues. Um, we've also had uh, uh, someone appointed independently uh, to, uh, to assess the progress that Ferguson's are making uh, regarding uh, on these two ferries. Uh, and uh, is reporting directly to CMAL on the matter uh, and to Transport Scotland or directly to CMAL? Is it reporting back into um, Scottish Government colleagues and uh, economy? Supporting economy. So um, uh, around the progress they're making in these issues. So uh, there is delays, um, uh, which is unfortunate because the two new vessels are critical to helping to provide greater resilience on the ferry network in Scotland, given the, great, the, the increasing demand uh, which it's facing. Uh, as well. In relation to the wider claim that um, Ferguson's have, um, that's a, these were a, a, a design and build a, a fixed price contract uh, which they entered into. Uh, any change to that is a matter which would have to be uh, negotiated and dealt with in, through any, 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 any discussions about any additional costs they've incurred and ultimately could end up in the courts. I mean, you're saying it's design and build, um, and we haven't seen the contract, so I don't know what it says. I, I, Ferguson's, from what I understand, understood that it was to be, they would work jointly with um, CMAL on the final design and build of the ferries. And they claim that because they didn't get enough information from CMAL, they had to, for example, start building the ferries from the middle rather than from the stern and that inevitably has cost extra money. So they certainly are claiming an amount which we do not yet know, but I mean, I was quite taken aback to read the CMAL accounts, which we just got recently, which include the statement, we have reviewed all potential claims with the benefit of legal and expert advice and have concluded that there are no contingent liabilities to be noted in the accounts. Now, given the, the, the discussion we had with uh, on the Aberdeen Western peripheral route where you know, there's acceptance that there could well be a bit of extra cost on both sides. You know, I'm somewhat gobsmacked to have to say that CMAL think there are going to be no extra costs for these ferries. Well, look, at their, their, their accounts have got to be returned on what they believe is, is true and accurate at that particular uh, point. If there is no substantiated claim um, at that particular point, then they can't, they can't report that they have uh, one. So any, 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 any claim in this, because you, you, you've, you've used the term claim several times, um, any claim is one which would obviously have to be assessed and evidence-based and data to actually support it. Uh, and ultimately, if it can't be resolved between CMAL and Ferguson's directly, it may be a matter which will end up having to be uh, resolved in another uh, place. But at this stage, they are, they are claims and they have to be substantiated. I accept that, but my parallel is with the Aberdeen Road as well, where I thought you were very balanced in your answers that, you know, there could be claims and they will work their way through. But, I mean, by my understanding, that's the difference between a liability, which there is not at the moment, and a contingent liability, which is something that could arise given certain circumstances. And for CMAL to claim that there's not even a contingent liability, let alone a real liability, again, I just find... Um, somewhat surprising. Well, they would have to be able to substantiate that uh, and how they've arrived at that position. Uh, and also uh, uh, any subsequent claim whether the information they've provided was accurate, uh, 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 accurate at the time when they provided it within their accounts. Sorry, John, if you finish. Cabinet Secretary, I mean, it, it would concern me that, that CMAL are... are uh, within your remit, and we've we've got an account. To, uh, sorry, Ferguson Marine haven't lodged accounts since 2015. There's no accounts for 2016 or 17, which would perhaps uh, be viewed by most people as very suspicious that a company hasn't lodged accounts for two years in arrears, and the company's house could actually strike them off from being a company for doing that. If there was liabilities within their accounts or potential liabilities, it sh there should be a balance you know, between them, but we can't check the accounts. 
So we have no way of verifying whether that there is an outstanding claim. Does that not cause you concern, especially as the government's left lent them 45 million? Well, it's important that Ferguson Marine, I, I can't be responsible for Ferguson Marine in uh, what they do with their accounts. The taxpayers' money. Exactly. Uh, and that's why uh, uh, any claim has to be substantiated. Uh, but we have a company based. that hasn't lodged and, accounts. And, well, it's for them to be able to, it's for them, they're responsible for issuing their own accounts. I can't make them issue their accounts. Uh, uh, but any claim uh, has to go through the proper due process uh, to be substantiated, just I, in the same way that it would be for something like the AWPR. I, I absolutely understand that, but if, if, if I was dealing with a company where I was had a contract with them for £97 million, I'd lent them £45 million on top of that, and they haven't lodged a count for two years. Let me tell you, I'd be very worried, and, and I, I believe you should be worried. John, do you want to come back on that? Well, I mean, on that point, I mean, is it, do you think it's the case that the, the claim is so horrendous that when they publish their accounts, that claim will be in the public domain? Um, well, Ferguson Marine would have to explain that. Uh, I mean, has the government no, I don't know, responsibility or, or, or some kind of more direct control? Because, I mean, the two sides, I mean, CMAL are also a, a separate legal entity. Um, I mean, is it the government's position that, you know, we don't know where the fault is in the, all this? A, and we're taking Seamal's side, or we're taking Ferguson Marine's side, or neither side, or what is the government's position? Well, our, our view is that, is that both Seamal and Ferguson Marine need to uh, resolve any dispute which they have around any potential claims, and there's a process for that to be carried out. Uh, it, is for, uh, it is for them to engage in that process in order to resolve any outstanding claims which they have. Uh, but Seamal clearly... Had, sorry, if Seamal had to settle for a higher amount... The government would automatically have to write that cheque. Well, but it, it, it would have to be substantiated because I've no, got no, absolutely no doubt is. that in Audit Scotland looking at it and this committee looking at it, you'd want to be satisfied that the taxpayers' uh, interests have been taken account of here. No, I accept that. Jamie, a brief question followed by. <coughs> sure. I, I mean, if you know, this, this, goes back, keep brief. this goes back to the AWPR thing. You, you, you know, you're talking about protecting the taxpayers' interest. It's not protecting the taxpayers' interest that these projects are going over budget in the first place, uh, regardless of whose liability it is. You know, whether it's the uh, ScotRail delayed carriages, it's Hitachi's fault, HST, it's Wabtec's fault, sleeper trains, it's the manufacturer's fault, the new ferries, it's the manufacturer's fault, uh, AWPR, it's the, it's the contractor's fault, it's always somebody else's fault. At which point, Cameron Secretary, do you take responsibility for any of this? But it is their fault. So it's never any, you've just, it's you've never just your listed fault. to okay. me. You've just listed to me companies that are running over. So uh, Hitachi, Hitachi, well, what does that say about Hitachi, how these projects? Hitachi, Hitachi, Hitachi. That's a good question. You might want to ask Hitachi, um, as I asked our global president just last week. Um, Hitachi failed to meet the several tar targets that they set for delivering carriages as well. Be, you've Wabtec. been through them all. Let's not go through them all again. Sorry. Well, but, but, uh, with all due respect, convener, he has put these specific allegations to me. Is that Wabtec have failed time and time again to meet the targets which they were set right. as well. CAF have failed to meet the targets which were set for them when it came to delivering the new rolling stock for the sleeper. The contractors who may have a claim on the, what do you call it, an AWPR, if they have a claim, they need to substantiate their claim. That's a claim which they've incurred because they entered into a contract which was a fixed cost contract that they went into with their eyes wide open. So the responsibility does lie with them. I'm simply pointing that out and they need to take responsibility for their failure to deliver on things that they went into contracts and agreeing that they would do. The Transport Scotland take no... no responsibility at all for any of these failures? Well, it, from some of the question, it would appear that the taxpayer should just accept the errors of private sector companies in failing to deliver on contracts that they enter into. These are companies that go into these contracts with their eyes wide open. If they fail to deliver on it, that is their responsibility. What we then try to do is to make sure that any issues that arise of an impact on in the in travelling public or where it's use of roads is we try to minimise that and progress matters. But what I'm not prepared to do is to accept responsibility for the failures of organisations within the private sector that have not delivered on commitments that they gave. Right, Cabinet Secretary, we're going to move on to the next question, which briefly, Colin, is from you before we move on to uh, John Finney. 
J just on the issue, coming back to the, the, this ferry contract, I mean, there are two organisations involved, one of which is, is obviously publicly owned. Now, given this is taxpayers' money, given that these are lifeline public services, what are the government doing to show leadership and bring people together to try to resolve this dispute instead of simply saying it's for others to sort out? What are we doing? As a, or what is the government doing to bring people together to sort this out? So it would be fair to say there have been a, a range of meetings taking place uh, between the uh, Scottish Government, CMAO uh, and uh, Ferguson's to try and find a resolution to some of the challenges which have uh, been faced. Uh, not just myself, have I been involved in that? The, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance has been involved in it as well, uh, given that they have lead responsibility for the uh, uh, loan arrangements for Ferguson's uh, Marine. Alongside that, we are... Uh, uh, given the delay that there's going to be with the uh, with the two vessels which they are constructing, uh, it, we are also um, reviewing an existing ferry plan uh, to look at how that can be improved and enhanced. Uh, there's also a, a ferry action plan which has been taken forward at the present time to look at improving communications uh, uh, to the travelling public and how uh, how Calmac are dealing with some of the, the uh, some of the adverse weather incidents which they are experiencing. So there's a there's a range of work being taken to try and help to improve uh, uh, the arrangements with the uh, ferry services overall, while at the same time there's also uh, work that's been uh, undertaken internally in government uh, between the different parties to try and get a resolution to some of these matters. Uh, my primary focus is to, uh, uh, from a transport perspective, is to see these vessels completed as soon as possible uh, so they can get into the network to provide us with additional resilience in the network, uh, given the challenges that we face at the present time. He brings in John on his, his question, which is the next Thank you, one. Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, can you provide an update on the review of ferry service procurement, please? So there's been... Uh, we published our uh, details of that last December, um, uh, which set out we've been engaging with the European Commission um, on this matter about the possibility of uh, direct awards. Uh, the feedback from the Commission has been that um, uh, uh, the threshold to, uh, to offer direct awards is very high and very challenging uh, and will be a challenge for us to meet. Um, but officials within Ferry Division uh, within Transport Scotland have been working on this and looking at it. They maybe say, say a, a bit more about the work that we are undertaking uh, on this matter, but we have been engaging with the Commission around uh, possibly progressing this further, but it will be complex. Uh, and any decision in the matter uh, would be uh, one that would be taken around 2022. Um, when, the, when the, new, uh, the new contracts are, are due to be reconsidered. Fairly, fairly, fairly summarise the situation. Clearly, colleagues have been over in the European Commission. I was over again three weeks ago speaking to the European Commission about other matters, but clearly, as, as the Cabinet Secretary said, it's pretty challenging. But we are continuing to pursue this. In the meantime, we are we're procuring the Northern Isles Ferry Services. That's progressing uh, satisfactorily with the view to put a new contract in place uh, for uh, autumn next year. Uh, so, yeah, work is progressing, but in terms of time scales, the CAMLAC are running the contract currently till uh, 2024. And uh, so, a couple of years in advance of that, we need to make a future decision about the way forward whether we can make a direct award as government preferences or whether we can uh, uh, need to continue to tender the services. Thank you for that. I, I wonder the extent in Tekel and Altmark have been talked about a, 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 a lot. Of course, we could be in a situation in a few months' time where will, the, will that have any continuing relevancy if the UK was out with the, the European Union? Um, I did say if, Cabinet Secretary. And, um, because presumably that's a contingency that you have to look at and it could be a, a game changer in respect of this particular issue. Well, I, I, who knows where we will be uh, in that issue in the coming days and weeks. Uh, but clearly, um, uh, uh, depending on what does happen, could have an impact on, uh, a, on this matter, given it's a, it's a state aid issue and it's a matter which the Commission have a clear interest in. Um, we'll have to factor that into our planning and thinking going forward, depending on what the outcome is. Leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and Richard, you're going to ask yeah. a very brief question. Just brief. Uh, coming near the budget, are you building in uh, each year? Are you looking at building in each year to replace ageing ferries? Uh, so we've invested something in the region of um, £1.4 billion in the... Uh, in our ferries since 2007. Um, we've added something like eight additional ferries to the network over that period of time as well. Uh, the two ferries which are in procurement at the present time uh, uh, are, are in construction at the present time are critical to helping to provide us with greater resilience. 
uh, and what we will be looking at as part of the review of the ferry plan is to look at what further um, uh, ferry, uh, uh, what other ferries we may have to look at replacing in the in the years ahead, and how that will then fit into our programme of procurement work. Thank you, and Cabinet Secretary. Uh, as you know, we wrote to you uh, extensively about this, and we'll look forward to a detailed response post the twelfth uh, of December which I know you'll be looking forward to producing. The next question is from Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, the Cycling Action Plan for Scotland, published in January 2017, aimed for 10% of everyday journeys to be made by um, bike by 2020, but there has only been a slight increase uh, from 2.3% in 2010 to 3% in 2017. Um, and there's also varies uh, from, uh, it varies from uh, region to region, I think 0.4% in Stirling up to 9.8% in Edinburgh. Do you believe that this target is going to be reached and what are you doing to get us there? I think it's going to be a challenge to reach the target now. A um, uh, couple of key issues around um, uh, increasing the number of people who are uh, uh, choosing to cycle. Um, uh, one is uh, education and two, infrastructure. Uh, doubling the active uh, travel budget uh, up to £80 million in the last year has allowed us to put additional investment into supporting infrastructure improvements, uh, which I think can help to encourage people to, um, uh, to, to engage more in active travel options, including that of uh, cycling, uh, greater education provision. Uh, I've been very clear with my officials as well, given the regional variations that you've mentioned as well, is that I'm also conscious that there potentially there can be social variations as well, that we are also reaching into those in our more deprived communities uh, to ensure that they don't lose out on the opportunity uh, to take an active travel option, uh, including that of cycling. So one of the things that we have been, uh, 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 I want to look at is how we can help to support planning around social housing provision that helps to deliver greater uh, cycling infrastructure as part of its planning and part of its design as it goes forward. Uh, so we're hardwiring it into our thinking and our planning when we're developing these types of uh, uh, programmes and we've been having discussions with the counterparts and the planning side within Scottish Government how that can help to be embedded into, into uh, uh, designs in the future. Um, the other thing which we're... Uh, which, uh, I think is worth recording is that we are seeing an increase in the number of people who are choosing to cycle for short distances. So that's uh, that last couple of miles is on the increase. Um, having said that, it's around 4%. It's the highest it's ever been, uh, but it's still a way off what we want it to actually be. Um, so I think in summary, I would say it's going to be challenging to reach that target, to be perfectly frank. Uh, but I do think we have a number of things in stream that can help to support us in continuing to move in the right direction. Uh, and the uh, uh, significant increase in the active travel budget is one of the key factors that can help to deliver the infrastructure, which I think will be one of the most important elements to helping support people to make a more active travel option. Thanks. I was going to mention the um, deprivation issue, which I know featured quite heavily in the second last edition of Holyrood magazine, which I was quite interested to read, um, and also your uh, take on that. What about rural areas? Because obviously it can be very, very difficult, especially in the winter time, um, to, to undertake any kind of uh, long journey on a bicycle. Um, what uh, infrastructure can you provide in more rural areas as opposed to the urban areas? It's a challenge. So um, uh, I don't know whether it would be um, heated gloves. Uh, uh, to call, uh, uh, I, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not entirely. So um, there's lots of things that ministers can have an influence on. The weather is not one of them, uh, and I know that as a transport secretary. But um, would you call? I think it, it's it's. Um, it, I think, for example, one of the things that um, uh, they've introduced in Dundee is the. Is the is at the train station is the new uh, cycling hub which they've created there, which is a heated facility for storing bikes and etc. Uh, which I think people can also store some of their kit possibly as well, uh, uh, which allows people to make that choice even though the weather might not be that great. So, um, uh, falling short of uh, tunnels etc. for cyclists to use to keep them out of the elements, I think it is looking at endpoints of the locations where we potentially could create infrastructure that may make it more attractive for you to cycle, knowing at the other end you've got somewhere where you can dry your bike and also uh, you can dry your kit. Um, 
uh, some of that may be about employers providing those facilities as well uh, to encourage their, their staff to be able to make those options. But uh, beyond that, uh, uh, there will always be a challenge for anybody that cycles that uh, the elements very often get the better of you one way or the other. Thank you. Okay. Um, if we could just move on to the next one and, and talk, I'm going to ask you a question on the letter you wrote uh, to the committee on the no national transport strategy was to be out for consultation in early 2019 uh, with a publication in summer 2019. Cabinet Secretary, what does officials have advised that, that those tone scales are under review mean, except for that you've kicked it into the long grass? No, it hasn't been kicked into the long grass because the, uh, the uh, strategy will be published by the end of next year. Um, uh, the reality is that we are facing significant challenges within Transport Scotland around resource management to meet some of our planning for Brexit, uh, which has allowed us, which has meant we've had to look at reassigning staff into our unit uh, that's planning for the potential implications that Brexit could have, which means that we don't have the same resource to be able to deploy to some of the other areas of work that we would wish to move on with. That has resulted in us having to look at delaying some of the work that we would take forward over the National Transport Strategy. Uh, but the intention is that the National Transport Strategy will be published by the end of next year. It, it, it should be said, though, there is already work ongoing around the, uh, the NTS. Uh, so we've already had uh, engagement with a whole range of different stakeholders and organisations who have an interest in uh, what the future shape of our transport strategy should be, because that will be for the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, looking ahead, um, we intend to have a, a draft published um, uh, uh, in the spring, latter part of the spring of uh, next year, uh, which will allow for greater engagement uh, with the completed strategy at the end of the year. But it is, it's any, uh, reviewing it is largely on the basis of having to look at reallocating staff to deal with Brexit issues. I'm always nervous about seasons and, and, and when a season actually starts and ends because it seems to stretch itself. Could you give me a month when you think the consultation will start on the National Transport Strategy? Uh, when the consultation will start, um, I, would, I would hope that we'd be in a position by uh, the end of May next year to be in a position where that can happen. Okay. Maureen, yours is the next question. Yes, uh, Cabinet Secretary, the um, transport for, well, while we've been discussing the transport bill, we've been trying to reconcile, you know, the fact that bus, pass and bus patronage is continuing to decline as it has been for decades. Um, but yet, if we're going to meet our tri climate change targets um, and decarbonisation, uh, we've got to either, in we've got to increase active travel and um, travel by public transport. So, can I ask you, um, how do you reconcile all this um, in order that we do meet our, our uh, climate change targets? Well, clearly, transport is a, con a big contributor to the uh, our over overall uh, uh, climate change uh, uh, figures. Um, uh, uh, active travel, so by doubling the active travel budget, a key part of which is to help to try and support delivering more infrastructure, uh, more programmes to encourage people to take active travel options uh, and uh, to look at how we can uh, design some of our uh, public realm in a way uh, that encourages people to take an active travel option. Uh, alongside that, the work we're doing uh, around decarbonisation, so for example, uh, uh, setting our target to uh, no longer uh, to uh, or for no longer people to find themselves in a position where they have to uh, purchase a diesel or a petrol uh, vehicle by 2032, which is eight years ahead of the UK government target. This uh, to try and look at reducing uh, the level of uh, uh, vehicles that contribute to um, uh, to our uh, uh, climate change um, challenge. Uh, alongside the introduction of low emission zones in our four big cities, uh, to look at how we can improve uh, how we can improve air quality in these areas, and also help to encourage people to uh, look at 
more active travel options, but also uh, greener travel when they are choosing to travel, um, whether it be electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles or low emission uh, vehicles. Uh, so there's no, no single solution. It's a, a multitude of different things uh, that we need to take forward from the active travel element to investing in public transport to support people when making use of that uh, into also helping to support the transition to low carbon vehicles and the introduction of low emission zones and how that will help to support people making more active travel choices and improve vehicles uh, which cause less pollution. One of the things um, that we've learned is obviously that buses um, and bus operators say that people won't go on the bus because they can get stuck in traffic like everyone else. C uh, is there anything that you can do to help local authorities introduce more bus lanes, for example? So we, we had some of this discussion when I was here uh, giving evidence to on the transport bill. Um, uh, uh, part of uh, uh, the success of the introduction of low emission zones uh, will be around the other actions that local authorities can take to help to give greater bus prioritisation. So uh, the figure I heard was that the average speed of a bus going through somewhere like Glasgow is three miles per hour. So if you can get that up to six miles per hour, you can actually increase the uh, the journey time much better or decrease the journey time for passengers and give it much greater reliability. The pillars are there for councils to take forward uh, bus prioritisation and the introduction of low emission zones, I believe, are actually one of the measures that can help to support that uh, and help to add to that because uh, uh, greater reliability around uh, the time it will be taken uh, and journeys, I think, is one of the key things that can help to encourage people to choose to use the bus. We'll bring in John, because I, I'm conscious I should have brought you in earlier. Sorry, John. That's OK, thank you, um, Convener. Um, we're told in our papers here, Cabinet Secretary, that the National Transport Scotland is, is transport strategy is the Scottish Government's long-term vision. Um, and I'd like to quote from Transport Scotland's recently published transport forecasts, um, because it's quite a bleak vision. And just half a dozen statistics, if I may. An increase, um, this is on the baseline of 2014, um, but by 2037, an increase of 25% in person trips by car, 44% increase in goods vehicle trips, a 37% increase in vehicle miles. And then, no surprise, that increases journey times, it will add to congestion, and the very damning uh, prediction that a uh, continuing decline in urban bus passengers of 7%. What feature is the trying to get, for instance, dealing with these individually. Um, the idea that just by changing the fuel itself is going to be sufficient and having low emission zone is going to be sufficient, that's not going to tackle the issues of congestion that, that Maureen alluded to there. Similarly, you know, m more goods being conveyed by road. Is it not time to uh, change the approach? Uh, and the answers I repeatedly get when I raise the issue of the carriage of freight by rail, that this is a commercial private sector matter not to do with the government. Surely it's absolutely essential if we have that damning figure, a 44% increase in goods vehicles trips, then we should be looking at better ways of conveying that. Look, can I say in terms of freight, it's not just a matter which is a commercial decision. Um, uh, Scottish Government, we, we provide funding to help to support uh, freight programmes. So for example, uh, uh, the work that's been carried out uh, in Blackford and in, in, uh, uh, just outside, outside uh, uh, Dunblane uh, will uh, allow us to get freight, a freight link into, uh, I'm just giving it as a practical example, um, a freight link into, uh, into Highland Spring, which will have a massive impact on the number of, uh, a number of vehicles which they use uh, for carrying their products to, uh, to market. And we are putting investment into that to help to facilitate it. So, um, I don't want you to think that I'm of the view that it's purely a commercial view. No, the government has got a role to play in helping to support and promote it. And that's a practical example of that happening. There is also the issue about companies, though, making the choice to use freight eh, on rail rather than by road. But is it not Which the is case a commercial that, decision. That, that, that may be a commercial decision, but it's a commercial decision that can be heavily influenced by government. So, for instance, government shouldn't be providing money um, significant sums of monies to, for instance, an industrial venture that's beside a rail track and not make it a condition that at least there's consideration of carriage of goods by rail. Well, I think that's a fair point that you raise. Um, but there is always a need as well, though, for commercial operators, um, companies, to choose to want to look at utilising rail freight 
for the distribution of their goods. So, for example, when we had the, the whisky train um, a number of years ago, I remember reading a report on that, which was heavily supported by, by government at the time. Uh, the challenge was actually getting the, the companies to make use of it, uh, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to uh, using, uh, using road as well. Uh, the challenges we had, for example, in using uh, at Rosyth and the ferry link into Zeebrugge, uh, the challenge was getting road users to move into using uh, 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 the sea link as opposed to travelling down through England to uh, the ports in the southeast of England to uh, cross into mainland Europe. So there are uh, there are challenges around that, but I I, I don't for a minute though uh, want you to think that uh, we don't have an interest in trying to encourage greater use of rail freight. Um, we are specifically taking forward some action to try and help to support and encourage more of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you John. Uh, the next question is uh, Mike Rumbles. Mike. Thank you, Convener. Um, Prestwick Airport and taxpayers' money. Um, over the last five financial years, the Scottish Government has loaned Prestwick Airport um, £40 million. And the figures that we have for the operating profit and loss accounts for the last nine years of the company show annual losses each and every year and operating losses, cumulative loss of £57 million. So my question, Minister, is you must have looked at this and thought, when are we ever going to get our taxpayers' money back? Have you any idea? So as it stands just now, um, uh, at Presswick Airport, uh, which is a major piece of national infrastructure, extremely important to the Ayrshire economy, given the businesses which are associated with uh, Presswick Airport, uh, it's had in the region of about uh, £38.5 million from the Scottish Government uh, uh, to date. It's able to draw down in this financial year uh, just under £8 million uh, for uh, its continuing uh, work. Um, I recently met with the Chief Executive and the Chair um, of Presswick Airport, um, who uh, have assured me that they are pursuing every possible avenue to uh, reduce their cost base, but also to increase their revenue. Uh, they also engage with uh, interested parties who may have an interest in taking over uh, Presswick as a commercial concern. Um, uh, uh, but it is a, it's a very challenging environment in the, se the aviation sector uh, with overcapacity. We saw the recent uh, impact in fuel prices has had on a business like a, a, an airline like Flybe. Um, uh, it's going to remain very challenging to get more passenger flights in there. But the wider um, uh, industries which are supported by Presswick are extremely important to the Ayrshire economy, which is why the Scottish Government stepped in at the time uh, to take on ownership of it. Uh, uh, and what we will continue to do is to see where there are uh, uh, private sector interested parties in taking on uh, responsibility or to take over responsibility for Presswick going forward. So, yeah, they do have a cost to the taxpayer, but I also recognise the value it has to the local economy, uh, which can't be underestimated. So we're giving another loan to the company this financial year, are we? It's a, it's a loan which is available to them to draw down up to, uh, I think it's about 79 uh, million pounds uh, that they can draw down uh, from the discussions I've had with the chair and the chief executive in this financial year, they feel they've made more progress in reducing their cost base uh, and also increasing their revenue uh, into the business as well. If you look at the last nine years operating losses, and they are operating losses, they're very similar. I mean, the last year we have figures is 6.4 million, previous year 6.5 million, previous year to that, six million, previous year, five million, right back to 2008, five million. It's pretty standard stuff, and uh, there doesn't seem, going on the past record, much prospect of the Scottish taxpayer ever getting their money back. Are you confident that we'll actually get any money back? Well, look, um, keep in mind, these loans are provided on the basis of their commercial loans. They're at commercial rates as well. Um, any party that was coming in to uh, look at taking ownership of um, uh, uh, or to purchase Presswick, uh, they would all feature as part of any negotiations, given that these are cost loans which are, are linked to Presswick directly itself. So uh, when you ask me directly the question, are we going to get that money back? Um, uh, I wish I could give you a very clear answer on it, but I can't at the present time because it's dependent upon 
whether there is uh, 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 another party that wants to come in and take ownership of Press Week, and it would then be dependent upon what was in those negotiations uh, going forward. But I, but, but I, I just want to make the point is that the reason that the government has stepped in and makes uh, these loans available to uh, Press Week is because of the critical nature that the airport has to the wider industry that's supported by Press Week Airport. If I may just continue this. Yeah, OK. In the two and a half years I've been on this committee looking at this issue, those are the responses from previous ministers and, in fact, from the company. And yet we don't see any evidence of any new uh, operators at the airport. Uh, there's one uh, scheduled airline, Ryanair, two scheduled freight customers, Cargo Lux and Air France. Is there any prospect, any real prospect of getting any more people to use this airport? Well, I, th I think in the aviation sector, um, particularly on passenger side, scheduled flights, um, that will remain very challenging. We can see with, um, uh, with Ryanair moving from a, a significant number of flights from Glasgow to Edinburgh, just the way the changes are going on. So that's always going to be challenging. There are bespoke services that, uh, that Press Week provide, uh, which is uh, unique, uh, not just in Scotland, but in the UK and to some extent in Europe. Um, uh, which is why it still attracts some of the services which it, which it does provide. Um, so particularly around unusual freight, um, I'm told that the uh, abnormal types of freight that they can cope with that other, uh, what do you call other airports don't deal with because of the, 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 the equipment infrastructure which they have. Uh, the discussion I had, and of course they, they operate at arm's length to the government uh, uh, for state aid purposes, uh, but I uh, uh, got a very clear uh, impression from both the chair and the chief executive last week that they are in a position where they believe they are making progress on reducing their cost base and increasing their revenue by trying to pursue some of the very bespoke services that they offer more effectively. Uh, and uh, uh, they hope to make better progress with that in this financial year. On the issue of another buyer, another, uh, another operator, um, you appreciate that's not going to be in the public domain um, uh, for commercially sensitive reasons, uh, but uh, uh, the opportunity remains there for, uh, for other operators to come in and look at purchasing the, the airport if they, if they wish to do so. Okay, now there's, there are a list of questions now, and, and I'd say to each person who wants to ask a question, you get to, you're going to get to ask one question, and I would really ask the Cabinet Secretary to keep your answers as brief as possible. So, starting off, Colin. Thanks, Gavina. The First Minister's questions last week, the First Minister said all government agencies should pay the living wage. Now, given that, that Presswick Airport is owned by the government, do you think it's acceptable they still don't pay the living wage? And what representations have you made to them to ensure that they do start to pay the living wage? So, uh, questions. So, which one do you want me to answer then? <laughs> could I ask you, Cabinet Secretary, to answer them both briefly? But could I say to other members, I, I, if you ask two questions, I will pick one for him to answer. So, Cabinet Secretary, if you could answer that. The... Yes, I do. And I understand from Press Week that they are making progress to ensure that their employees are covered by the living wage. OK. John Mason. Um, I mean, it was suggested that one option is that if the passengers are losing a lot of money, but the freight and other things is making money, then we could drop the passengers altogether and carry on as a freight-only or special airport. Is that an option? Um, uh, not at the present moment. Freight's a specialist uh, service which they offer, <laughs> but they, uh, 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 to lose their passenger services at the present time would be a, lo a loss of revenue for them. Uh, which you wouldn't want to undertake. Uh, and I don't think that's set out in the business plan that has been uh, set forward by Press Week, which is a five-year business plan, which they're already working on. OK. Jamie Green. Uh, thank, thanks, Convener. I'm not convinced that the passenger business is actually profit-making, but maybe we, if we can check that in terms of the numbers. Um, but just in terms of the, the potential sale, um, do you think coming with a, a price tag of all that historic debt... Uh, that the government has loaned to the business is making it an appealing sale to potential private investors. And at which point, and it is a single question, is it, you know, has the government considered um, uh, put, no, you know, drawing a line under, under those loans or is it still seeking to you know, get back as much as it can? 
you seem to be keen for me to give a lot of money to private sector companies. Uh, can I say I'm not going to get into a negotiation around uh, what would be on the table or off the table with any particular dealer for Press Week? It would be completely inappropriate. OK, I, I have a, 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 a very simple question. I think, it, based on the fact that uh, £40 million has been loaned to Presswick Airport, can you confirm whether a valuation of the assets of, of Presswick Airport by an independent valuer has given a value in excess of £40 million? Can we give is there details of that? What's going on at the moment? Yeah. That's part, part of the work that's going on at the present time. Sorry? So it's part of the work that's been carried out at the present time? Yeah. So when it's available, will you be able to answer that question? Yeah. So yes. that was two questions, and, and I chastised myself for that. Stuart Stevenson, um, thank you. With uh, the last question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we've touched on uh, uh, emission, greenhouse gas emissions, um, and we're seeing it going up in transport. Um, I'll maybe just ask a very tightly focused question. Uh, with the transfer of many train services from diesel to electricity, clearly that's an opportunity to reduce emissions. Uh, given that Network Rail is the biggest purchaser of electricity anywhere in the UK, I believe, um, would it be possible to transfer, persuade them to transfer their electricity contract to a renewable electricity only contract and thus reduce the figures in what is a significant area of rising uh, carbon emissions? Yeah, I think that's a that's a, a very reasonable point. I do know that the uh, uh, that ScotRail have made significant progress in reducing their own um, uh, uh, carbon footprint, uh, if you want to put it that way. Um, and uh, I think if Network Rail could make a contribution to that as well, that would be that would be the right thing to do. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Cabinet Se Secretary. That's been a, that's been a long session. I, I would normally suspend the meeting to allow you to depart, but I'm going to ask if you could depart quietly so I can continue the meeting, so that I don't lose committee members at the same time, and and move on to agenda item four, which is European Union Withdrawal Act notifications, and there are in fact seven in relation to UK SIs as detailed on the agenda. These cover genetically modified organisms, common agricultural policy and animal health. All the instruments are being laid in the UK Parliament in relation to the European Union Withdrawal Act. All seven have been categorised by the Scottish Government in general as Category A, making minor or technical um, amendments. Two of the proposed SIs on common agricultural policy could also can be considered as category B to the extent that the transition from, from an EU to a UK framework would be a major significant development. I would ask if any members of the committee have any comments on this. Uh, I'm going to go with John first and then Stuart. Um, th thank you very much. Uh, can I say at the outset, uh, Cap um, Cabinet Secretary, I was going to call you that. Uh, good bit, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so I beg your pardon. Can I say at the outset, uh, convener, that uh, I, I, I have no issue I will be supporting. Uh, I particularly like to comment the uh, genetic modification, SI for me, and the question about whether the law as it stands goes far enough to protect Scotland um, from GM crops and products. And, and basis, the basis for that is the statement by Michael Gove. And if I quote a headline from uh, the Times recently, Michael Gove pledges genetic food revolution. Um, uh, and a, a suggestion that Mr Gove uh, may plan to overrule an EU High Court decision from the summer which classed gene editing as genetic modification. So we could end up in, in a position where we nominally have a ban or very tight controls on GM, but the defin uh, definition of what GM is is very narrow and may, may mean that uh, essentially GM procedures are allowed. Can I ask that we ask, right, the Scottish Government asking for clarification on this uh, and particularly interested in whether there would be a joint process for deciding the definition of GM and GM processes in the future or understand whether that would be a matter that would be simply left to the UK Government to, to define because that would be a concern okay. if it were. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Stuart. Um, just very briefly, Convener. Um, you point out that uh, some of the uh, measures might be category B, and I just ask that uh, it, it is that the, the government do notify us if, in their view, it has moved from A to B, so that we can give any necessary further consideration. I, 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 I think that's a good point. I don't think that, that 
that they will be viewed as that in due course. But I think it would be, um, from what I've heard, unless anyone else, has anyone else got anything to add? I think from what I've heard, um, providing we add uh, the questions that Mr Finney's asked to uh, the questions, I think we should uh, probably as a committee uh, confirm its content for, for the consent to the UKSI is referred to the notifications and note a request a response from the Scottish Government on the wider policy matters that, that have been indicated in the papers and the point that, John, you've raised. Are, are we agreed to do that? Okay, that's agreed, and that concludes this part of the meeting, and we'll now move briefly into private session.